thank Professor Berger Sant Baranda and Professor Marta Salamanca for this, I would say, splendid organization. I'm so happy to he be here in Madrid, and I think that last night was amazing. So thank you so much. Uh, and I also, of course, want to thank the uh, Carlos III University of Madrid for hosting uh, this event. It has been really a, a, a terrific event in, in uh, every um, aspect. Uh, and also that you actually host the, this event two years in a row. It's very special, uh, very special to us. So thank you so much. Uh, I will also take the, actually the opportunity to uh, thank Professor Mandieu. And um, I don't think that this would be, um, the organization will not be as it is today without you because you are, have such you are such an energetic and friendly and inclusive person, and uh, also a, a fantastic president for, for our organization. So thank you so much. Um, and also, lastly, before I, I start, I would like also to thank the, present the presenters from yesterday. It was really, really good presentation and I think I actually can implement a lot of uh, the things that were said. So thank you so much. But this uh, talk would be about uh, the working groups. As you know, we have working groups in, in uh, EIPTN, and we actually have six working groups. So we have one working group for business and entrepreneurship, and the chair is Janis Denningkort, and then we have one on IP and technology with Carolyn Coes. And then we have one on IP and science. And I don't think we have a share for that one, at least not on the, on the website. And then we have one on IP strategies and ethics. And that's Helen Gabby. And then we have one on IP and international economic law. Trade and investment in brackets. Um, and there we have uh, Gabriele Galliani. And then I am the chair of two working groups. And one is on IP and race relation to art, fashion, culture, and creative industries. So a very long name. And then the second one is actually on IP and fundamental rights. So I will just start to describe very shortly what we have done. So we have just have a few meetings in the group uh, and discuss what we actually should do or w would like to do. And um, different kinds of, of uh, suggestions came up, but we actually um, started with two different projects. So I will describe this project. And firstly, I will then, no, I see, I will then, where do I have it here? The fashion one. Hmm? Yeah. So firstly, I will describe the uh, one, um, the project we have in, in the group then uh, in relation to art, fashion, culture, and creative uh, industries. And um, we have actually uh, started two projects. Um, I will start with the one least developed, and that is actually the one on street art. Um, we we're discussing different topics that actually engage people in the group, and, and fashion and street art was, was these two subjects. So street art uh, is very interesting from, from different perspectives, I would say, because we have the tension between property and intellectual property. What can be done with street art when it's actually legal work? Can it be protected, for example? Can it be removed? What happens if the value of the building actually increases by uh, the art. For example, a Banksy. 
could you actually sell then the building and, and could you actually take the money for the art in a, in a sense? And also, um, what happened if it is an uh, infringement? And then I was thinking a lot about who could actually be liable, of course, the, the, the artist. But if you look at this case, C 494 slash 15, the Hilfiger case, you could actually see that it's more like they do the reverse that we are used to. So they take the, the solution for the digital uh, environment and actually apply it on the physical. Normally it's the uh, other way around. So you take the, the solution for the physical environment and then you apply it on the digital. So maybe if the, the uh, street art, for example, is not removed, it could actually be a secondary liability. I don't know. That's also interesting questions. And then um, Harris, he's not here today. Um, um, Hasek, he's proposed also, uh, I will take the next slide. He proposed also um, um, issues on uh, panoramic rights, uh, photographs of street art. He uh, uh, also uh, wanted to write something about street art and orphan works. And um, also, what, what key, can you actually repair the building um, if it's necessary and destroy the, the art? So more like moral right issues, I would say. And then uh, Mercedes um, uh, also came up with um, Professor Curtopolo also came up with interesting insights on, on street art. Do you want to say something in this, uh, Mercedes? Can we have her? Yeah. We should have her. Mercedes, please, would you wish to intervene? Mercedes, please, do you wish to intervene on uh, what is done with street art? Uh -huh. Mercedes? Yes, Mercedes? I'm here. Yes, yes. Yes. And we would yeah. uh, Ulrika has mentioned whether you want to intervene on the ideas you had on the street art uh, uh, project. I don't know why. Oh, okay, yeah, I think that's fine with my camera, I don't know what happened with my camera, but yeah, I want to introduce, thank you very much. Copyright issues in my proposal, but um, well, I was in Medellin, so like, two years ago, so before the pandemic, um, for me it was uh, quite uh, surprising um, um, uh, um, uh, an activity that they are developed there in, in the so-called Comuna 13. Comuna 13 is an area in Medellin which was uh, a place um, well, uh, very known because of the narco uh, 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 traffic, illegal traffic drugs uh, during the Escobar time. And in, in 2002, the government launched an, an attack over this uh, place, and some people died, and um, more, many were uh, wounded. And uh, after that, in 2015, the government created um, a, so a cable car and also some uh, outdoor state cases and they saw like an opportunity to be connected with the rest of the city and some local artists uh, started to create uh, a graffiti around all the, the, the comuna and nowadays it's a very touristic place when uh, well they, they try to uh, express their their feelings are the suffering through the graffiti and the street art, 
And now many people make their living uh, because of this graffiti, because of this street art. are many uh, local guides that uh, show the, the graffiti. Um, and most of the paints are sim symbolic. So for instance, elephants is like the memory. They don't want to forget uh, the, the previous uh, past, but they, they want to overcome this, um, this past uh, through the art. And for me, it was a very interesting uh, way in which the, the street art can contribute to the development of a, a city, in this case, an area, a very uh, a special area of a city. And also, there are some legal issues in this, uh, in this uh, project, like, for instance, an illegal activity, in principle, a illegal activity has uh, become the, the main uh, way to live in this uh, Comuna, uh, Comuna 13. But it's not like drugs or traffic drugs, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, art. So illegal, but uh, in a way, a very important issue in order to make their living. And also there are some issues like uh, the concept of graffiti is, um, permanent or is temporary. In this case, it's more like permanent art, not, not uh, so temporal, uh, I guess. Or, uh, well, uh, some issues like moral rights, modification, authorship is not so important. So the individual expression of an idea is more like a collective expression of an idea. So for me, it was an uh, interesting way in which the street art is uh, an instrument, is a vector of uh, improvement in, uh, in the society. So that, that was my proposal for this uh, working group, uh, uh, this um, work on, on street art. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the camera, but I don't know what I have done. <laughs> sorry, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So this is more like a starting point. We have, we will, we haven't done so uh, much work on it, more than a bra brainstorming work. <laughs> and we will actually develop it to, I think, uh, like a case book uh, with different kinds of cases. I will come back to it when you see IP and fundamental rights and our ideas on, on that. <clears throat> and then, no, like this. Here, a clicker. Yeah, thank you. And then the other project is um, a project that is actually a textbook because, <coughs> sorry. Ah, okay. Okay, so the other project is actually a case book about IP and fashion law. And we have started to write that case book. We could see that this um, is actually a market for an IP and fashion uh, textbook because there is only one book on, as I know at least, uh, on the European side, on fashion. And it's more like a general. It also has a descrip description of IP and fashion, but not only IP and fashion. And I also teach at Lund University fashion students. Uh, they are fashion students that actually have in a program, um, a three-year program. And, and um, I see that it's um, a, a demand for, for a book like this, actually. So we will describe the book uh, briefly. It's very small. Yes, perhaps, we shall we? <coughs> ask our IT people whether we could take them from, from here, actually, and not from the blackboard. Let us see. No, it's the uh, other one. In this case? That one. This one. No, the other one. Can we see bigger? Yeah. Uh, the the, the yeah. other one? No, no, that's the other one. That's the <laughs> fundamental right. That's okay, that's okay, Yolanda, we made it. No problem. <laughs> okay. Now we then make it this way. This 
Yeah. Okay, maybe. Okay, we will. <coughs> You should put it so that those on Blackboard can see it better. Yeah. Was it that one? No. no. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will describe it briefly, and I will also say that in, in all these cases, there is actually a um, possibility for you to contribute, because this is not fixed uh, yet, and if you want to do anything, just approach me. Um, so, but we have an outline for the book, and um, <coughs> we have an introductory chapter. Uh, it's, it's me and, and Gabriele that actually will write more an introduction and the importance of fashion in Europe. And we will describe then how important it actually is for Europe to have a protection on, on fashion law. And then we have chapter two, the uh, intellectual property rights system, and we don't have any author on that chapter yet. Uh, and it would actually then start from the historical and uh, societal and legal context and then describe the relevant areas of IP. And uh, it would also then examine the intent and actual function of IP protection for fashion. And then we will have one uh, chapter that I will write on fashion and, and copyright, and that's of course uh, very interesting also when it comes to the paradox of, of fashion, that you actually want to be copied in a sense, but you don't want to be uh, slavish copied. You want just to be influential. Uh, so there is actually quite a tension when it comes to IP protection and fashion also. Um, of course, the focus will also be on, on uh, functionality and um, derivative work. Um, and then we will have, of course, a, a fourth uh, chapter on uh, fashion and design, and both look at unregistered and registered design and case law uh, from the European Court of Justice, and also take practical example from the EU IPO's register on protected fashion items. So it will be quite hand-on. It will not be uh, a book that is more really, really legal in a sense, because we want to be able to use it also for like fashion students. Um, and then, uh, Mercedes, I call to you again. <coughs> Mercedes will uh, write the uh, uh, fifth chapter on fashion and trademarks. Yeah. Now, uh, now <laughs> I think that I have the camera on. Yeah, the, the fashion and trademarks. Well, uh, the, the fashion industry. We we will know that is um, uh, they, they they take a lot of care of their of their uh, trademarks because uh, creations are, are temporary. So for for them, it's very important to create this image uh, around an iconic uh, trademark and therefore they invest a lot uh, in this um, position of, of the trademarks in the in the in the market and uh, well it's obvious that, that therefore that uh, uh, trademarks are very important in the fashion industry but i i have focused mainly in the uh, in the non conventional non traditional trademarks uh, around fashion because uh, there have been some in recent more or less recent cases um, around this so we all know that uh, non conventional trademarks are um, well are allowed generally uh, because of the new trademark package after 220 uh, 2015, um, because the the abolition of the requirement of the, the, the physical or the, the, the visual um, description of the trademark or graphic description of the trademark, and and therefore it is um, 
uh, well, in the fashion industry, there have been some important cases from the Luxembourg court. Uh, so, for instance, the the the, the sole, the red sole of the uh, the, the Louboutin uh, shoes, uh, high shoes, or the Damier Azur uh, from Louis Vuitton. So, this pattern pattern uh, trademark, or for instance, in the racing year in the, this year the Guerlain uh, lipstick uh, I, which was resist, registered as a 3d trademark in the in the uh, repo so there are some important cases in which we can see that the non-conventional trademarks are important in the fashion industry uh, so trademarks in generally in general, but this uh, non-conventional, non-traditional, especially because they try to um, uh, so convey uh, some values, some images that is not so easy to convey to the consumers in, in the, to the normal or the conventional uh, graphic or, or word trademarks. Therefore, I uh, focus mainly in this with the uh, non-conventional, non-traditional uh, trademarks and mainly to case law. So the recent case law in this regard, so, so I think is uh, quite... Uh, illustrative for um, for our uh, students in order to uh, create or to come to the idea of the importance of the trademarks in the fashion industry. So that was my col contribution in this uh, booklet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and then I will write a uh, chapter uh, six on fashion and patents and that may be a bit odd because maybe not that many products in, in, in fashion is actually patented. But uh, <clears throat> when I've done some investigations, uh, it was also very interesting that some fashion designer actually patented their even high, in Sweden we have a specific high heels shoes producers that actually patented the, the way of, of, of uh, producing uh, or, or the angle I think the, uh, how they actually produce the shoe. And there is also um, a woman that started a big company with, she focused on breastfeeding clothes. And she actually patterned the way to design these clothes. So my idea when I was uh, seeing these examples was actually to, maybe we should in this booklet really approach also the designers and ask for permission to have examples in the book where you actually could then see, like in this case, Italian fashion, Swedish fashion, and, and, and Spanish fashion, and you could have really hands-on examples how they worked, like small cases also. So uh, um, I hope that that will be something that we can <clears throat> actually do, sorry. And then we have chapter uh, seven, fashion and culture expression. Also no uh, author at the time. Uh, so if anyone wants to write that one. And then we have fashion and advertising and also we'll focus on unfair competition. And then we have the protection of models and the celebrities. And here I know for, for a fact that it's um, quite interesting questions on, on, on the photographs and the privacy, of course, of the models, but also the ownership of the photographs. Um, and that seems to be, maybe it's not that different when it comes to the European countries, but at least worldwide. And we will also take example from adverts and video games in that chapter. And the last chapter is written by uh, Professor Gagliani. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, if I may, just a little footnote for the group on IP and international economic law. 
we haven't really worked that much in that group uh, as it's still small. Basically, we are three people. I'm the chair. So if anybody wants to join, of course, you're welcome. And as soon as we are uh, many more, we will start working. It's, it was the last group to be created, so very recent, right before the pandemic, or I think even during the pandemic. So, uh, so uh, just join the group. Advertisement. Okay, as for this uh, chapter, well, first of all, thank you very much for, for everything. Um, the idea of this chapter uh, came out of two uh, considerations. So the first one is that uh, textile is a very sensitive product in international trade because it has been such an important industry sector for a number of country, uh, countries in Europe and of course at the international level. And actually if you look at international trade law, um, uh, the discipline of textiles has gone hand in hand with IP. There was a historical consideration at the heart of these chapters when we were talking about it, which was the Cobden Chevalier Treaty a very old one, which basically concerned tariffs. You know, car tariffs for people who are not uh, familiar with that uh, is money that basically every product that has to cross a border has to pay, and not necessarily. It depends, of course, on the regulation. And so that uh, treaty, uh, going back to the 19th century, contained on the one hand tariffs on textile products and at the same time regulated designs. So first consideration. Second consideration still at the heart of this chapter, was the idea that uh, if you put IP and trade together applied to textiles, you will see that uh, there is uh, a discipline that may cover from A to Z. So from plant varieties, for, for example, the production of textiles uh, to uh, certain trademarks, certification marks, think about cotton, or think about trade secrets, silk. Yesterday we were looking at the dancer with a manton made out of silk. Uh, silk was a trade secret, the silkworms. It was in the hands of China, and then there are different historical versions on how to ca it came to Europe. But still it was concerned to trade. So there is an economic interest at the heart of it. So this chapter focuses a little bit on the in interaction between the two, both on the uh, regulatory side, so looking for example at the international trade law, free trade agreements and the multilateral agreements at the WTO until, let's say, not that recently we had an agreement on textiles, specifically on trading textiles, again sensitive. And on the other hand, also to reality. Because when we have trademarks, then as you know, uh, in most countries you need to use your trademark in trade, in the course of trade, and so how the two uh, relate. And so this, this chapter looks at this sort of dynamic dimension, and uh, as Professor Venison was uh, pointing out, actually, uh, there are some legal considerations, but as the book has a sort of wide audience, uh, the idea here is to provide also a number of real cases to be discussed, and that could be um, interesting for, uh, for, for students coming from different uh, fields. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So uh, we will end this group presentation that we actually welcome all your contributions to, to our <laughs> two projects. So if you're interested, just uh, approach me, as I said. Um, and then we will come to the second group. So. Yeah, the uh, second group that I'm chairing is IP and fundamental rights. And um, here we have produced a little booklet. I will also say here that we uh, welcome contributions to this book, little booklet. We have, uh, it's actually a booklet today. Um, so uh, the group that's worked on, on, on this little booklet is um, Professor Mandier and Professor Galliani and, and I, and we have then described different kind of specific topics within IP and fundamental rights. It's a small case, so it's like a case book. Um, small cases, around five pages, and it describes actually a scenario, and it has reading materials and questions. So it's a sort of tool for asynchronic and synchronic uh, teaching, I would say, and also, um, so there's a narrative with information about the complex problem 
within the area, and then it's supposed to like challenge the student to read, reflect, and analyze. So if we look at the, like, the solo taxonomy, we could see that firstly they, they should identify a legal problem, then they should be able to describe this problem, analyze and apply, and then of course like reflect, criticize, uh, explain the causes, relate to the, and, and also justify, and also um, maybe uh, come up with some solutions to these very difficult problems we have actually uh, put forward. So it's something that we think that would lead to more deep learning as they actually working with this case instead of, of yes, the surface learning. So it's actually today six cases uh, and we will describe the cases and also here we welcome more uh, contributions because we would like to have maybe 10, 12 cases that would be like perfect for, for this booklet. But today it's these uh, six cases. So we will start off with uh, Professor Gagliani's oh, work. Okay. Hello again. <laughs> So uh, basically this, uh, this chapter, as you can see, is focusing on intellectual property, the right to property and free enterprise. And here I would say uh, that um, I applied a logical, so legal reasoning, because that's what the law is. So the point to start was whether intellectual property rights are comparable to property rights. Um, so historically, uh, you know that um, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, intellectual property was sort of consecrated on the one hand and on the other, because you have the right to access to culture and creations, while on the other hand, the community can enjoy that. But there was no right to property because we were in the Cold War. And this has influenced also uh, further developments. So if you look at it, you may say, mm, I'm not sure whether intellectual property rights are equal to the right to property. But then right after, uh, uh, European uh, uh, Convention on Human Rights, uh, right to property, jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, intellectual property rights are comparable to the right to property. And so there we can have a long discussion because once you equal, you say that intellectual property rights are comparable to property rights. So if I have a property in a house, it's the same as if I have a patent or even if I have an application for patent protection, then of course there are a number of implications that stem from there in terms, for example, of guarantee or legal discipline. And it's worth the first sort of a step in this logical chain. But then there is a further one, which is, okay, even if we say, and that may be fine, that intellectual property rights are property rights, so they are subject to the same legal discipline, or at least we can apply analogically the same rules for property. So again, I have a house, or I have a property just in an object, and I can apply those rules to intellectual property rights. Philosophically, and even in economic terms, the right to property is considered as the centerpiece of market economies, right? And so what about intellectual property? Because on the one hand, it is certainly true that intellectual property spurs innovation, and so uh, it's good for a sound uh, market, but at the same time, in certain cases, so it's not IP in itself, it depends how it is used and regulated, it may, according to some people, be uh, counterproductive, right, in terms of market, if someone has too much power. And so here, there is this sort of discussion. Um, as Professor Veniston was saying, uh, the structure that we have followed for all the chapters was first a sort of articulation of this reasoning. In this specific chapter, I focus a lot and I put a lot of references for uh, cases of the European Court of Human Rights, where actually it says that intellectual property rights are property rights. And then actually we have a number of questions because the idea is for it to serve uh, for reflection, but in particular to, to teach. So some questions for reflection such as RIP rights identical, similar, or different uh, from property rights? Um, can we group all IP rights together when we compare them to property rights? Because also one important thing is that we talk about intellectual property. 
but the trademark is something that is completely different from a patent or from copyright. So the issue is, can we really like group them together and then say, oh, intellectual property, property, can we do that? Or should we really distinguish? Um, and then of course, uh, if property rights are human rights, this is connected to this. Uh, how does the tragedy of commons apply to IP rights? Because uh, if you, and I, here I talk to students because this may be something that is fresh in their head. When you study um, private law, the right to property, the basic explanation is the tragedy of the commons. If we share everything, everything is free, we don't care about it, sorry to oversimplify, and so basically we take our world and we throw it in the dustbin. If we establish the right to property, then we should avoid, should, uh, the tragedy of the commons, the tragedy of everything that is common. So how does it relate to intellectual property? And then how does IP uh, rights affect the freedom, uh, free enterprise basically, and how it could be balanced? Because I think that uh, the good lawyer's reply as always is, it depends, it's not good, it's not bad, it's the way you use it and you regulate it. Thank you. And Professor Gagliardi has the oh, next yeah. chapter also. <laughs> For the time being, we have left them in chronological order. Yeah. Then we will see how we structure them yeah. because we can issue them in the booklet. We can issue them in our booklet separately. So we can issue them as, as flyers and or as a full text. So we present them today in a certain order, but we may then change the order since we have flexibility on this, depending on the template of the publication. So before, because I see the eyebrows are going up to the, <laughs> like <laughs> up, up, up. So uh, clarification on the title. As the people who know me uh, know pretty well, I like a lot uh, trade law, <laughs> of course, <laughs> because I think that it adds a dynamic dimension. Because I think that uh, what's really important is to see how, at least for me, that's my interest. How IP rights work in trade, so with the dynamic situation, and that's why you see the trade part here. Um, this chapter uh, came out of some, uh, not only personal, but also professional uh, interest. Done some work also for WIPO on traditional knowledge. And so, again, the start here was Article 27, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's a human right, but hey, what happens when we uh, apply IP to uh, traditional knowledge. Because you all know, of course, that IP and culture have a strong relation. The problems may come up when we talk about traditional. And so here I articulated this paper focusing, also because we have sort of limited space, as we said, these are short chapters, um, around three, uh, basically, uh, three uh, questions. So the first one was the traditional part, which challenges uh, basically the fact that under IP rights, and this sort of applies in different ways to different IP rights, uh, there are of course requirements to be complied with. And we know pretty well that novelty, patent, novelty, trademark, novelty. Copyright is not novelty, but to me still the same originality. And so basically what you have is just one of several requirements that creates a number of problems where we're talking about traditional knowledge. So how the two uh, intersects. And this was the first uh, question. And of course here it should be stressed that probably certain IP rights are better suited than others to protect traditional knowledge. Geographical indications, or collective mark certification marks may be more suitable. We can discuss about that. These are, of course, open question. Um, second point uh, to be uh, articulated uh, is when uh, basically um, when there is a subject who is comes from outside a certain community and wants to appropriate. Uh, basically the traditional knowledge of that community. So some people talk about biopiracy, bioprospection. I'm not sure whether those terms are uh, good or describe well the phenomenon uh, because it's not uh, about bio necessarily. Uh, many of you for sure have heard the 
and we go to fashion the Carolina Herrera case in the Oaxaca. So Carolina Herrera, uh, Venezuela naturalized U.S. national. Basically, we don't know whether she goes to Mexico, to Oaxaca. She sees beautiful uh, dresses, and she decides that, wow, those are beautiful. Why don't we basically make uh, clothes such as this, and we launch them in New York? A lot of money. And people in Oaxaca, of course, are not happy. So second problem, appropriation from a person or a subject who comes from outside the community. And then um, third issue, uh, which is uh, basically um, a little bit of opening a box that I just uh, mentioned in the paper because uh, I think it's too big a box, which is the fact that when you deal with a traditional, uh, with traditional knowledge and with a community, you realize that IP in reality is connected to a number of issues that go beyond that. So to give you an example, I was uh, part of a workshop at WIPO where there was a person coming from a community in Chile. And this community, which is the Mapuche, actually, with the creation, with the fall of the Spanish Empire, so history, and basically the creation then of states, this community is in Chile, but is also in Argentina. And so the recognition of IP rights here for them is connected to the fact that they want to be reunited. They don't care whether it's Argentina or Chile. You know, it's just the community as a whole. And though here, there is a big box, which is the one of states, so whether states can represent them, who is going to recognize me a rights. Then there is the issue so of uh, the right to self-determination. There is an issue of uh, who will hold these rights. Because even though I am a member of the community, will it be me or will it be the community and how? So who will be the one to hold this right and to use it and in which way? So this was just a last part of this, of this chapter, which is a big box that I think it's very good to reflect upon that opens really a number of, of questions and, and problems that go beyond IP, but that also show how IP is at the heart of a number of issues that go well beyond the realm of IP. And, uh, and then there was, of course, the part on questions. So how do they relate? What IP rights may be better suited for traditional knowledge? And here I think that it should be a practical exercise. So to really think about what do I want to protect? And, uh, and then so on and so forth. What broader questions and all the issues we have discussed? Thank you very much. And then we have Professor Mandieu and patents and health. Well, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I, dear students, uh, dear participants, I have a very classical topic, uh, and a topic which is an, an old one that dates from the 19th century, whether medicines should be uh, patentable or not, uh, the, whether scientists choose to patent or not medicines, a big debate in the 1840s, in the 1850s, and uh, clearly enough, a debate we are uh, overwhelmed with currently with the uh, current pandemic. So uh, the, uh, the idea there in this, uh, in this uh, chapter of the booklet, or a booklet that can be declined also by flyers so that they be useful to academics for their teaching and to students for their research, uh, the idea is uh, uh, to reflect on the, uh, on the issues connected uh, uh, with the re uh, relation between Article 25 of the Declaration of Human Rights, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that establishes universal right to health, and uh, the Article 27 that establishes intellectual property rights on creations, and at the same time, right to benefit of this creation for the public. So uh, the, uh, uh, the booklet is, uh, the, well, this section of the booklet is articulated as uh, depicting the, uh, the tension between the two issues, right to health and right to appropriation of uh, uh, remedies on health and uh, uh, remedies simply, and as such uh, it describes the origins of this uh, tension, the uh, ways to alleviate it possibly, the, uh, of course what has been developed at the World Trade Organization since its creation, 
Therefore, the questions connected with the various dots of Article 27 uh, of the TRIPS Agreement, the Doha Declaration, the waiver of 30 August 2003, uh, the current debates on the waiver, which is just simply a repeat uh, with some different uh, uh, approaches, a repeat of what had happened in 2003, a uh, different approach since uh, two to three companies uh, or even one company has a dominant position. So whether their patents are standards and there is no need for the patent anymore. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, we, I tried to develop this, uh, this logics in a very, um, very simple and very uh, in a very short text that can be used by colleagues for teaching and that can be used by students for uh, um, also replying to the questions that are indicated there. So in each of our flyers there is, as uh, Ulrika and Gabrielle explained, as Professor Wenerstein and uh, Galliani explained, there is a section which is uh, uh, theory and cases, a section which is questions, and uh, bibliographical references, so that it is the works of colleagues and also of students. So this is uh, what has been done for uh, patents and health. Um, we are talking today uh, only of the six, uh, six uh, little flyers that are ready and can constitute a short book booklet. We intend to publish it by the end of the year probably formally in uh, 2022, so that we have an ISBN number, which is a 22-1, possibly. So uh, it's always better to have a fresh uh, publication. But it can be uh, also uh, further completed with other topics uh, under the leadership of our chair of the, of the working group. So uh, that's for patents and health. And then you have the next <coughs> uh, also. Yes, which is right to food and intellectual property. So uh, the uh, constructive relationship between uh, right to food and intellectual property. We all know that basically the first IP right granted in this planet was granted for a right to food 2,700 years ago. Um, it uh, is also linked with the, with the uh, well, I wouldn't say Greek, but uh, uh, Great Greece, Italian, Mediterranean, European approach of protective uh, inventiveness rather than knowledge, so new knowledge rather than knowledge. Uh, and this uh, brings us back also to the other topics of traditional knowledge and other issues connected to this. So this choice that was done 2,700 years ago that was constantly confirmed by uh, uh, European lawmakers that expanded through colonization to the world and that was uh, sanctified by the World Trade Organization. This concept makes that we are interested in protecting uh, innovation rather than acquired knowledge as such. And this has a major impact on right to food, a right that is guaranteed by the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which is really the the line of direction of all our uh, uh, flyers in this booklet. Uh, uh, right to food uh, is uh, much connected to, in order to feed people, to uh, new varieties of food. And therefore, how can we improve the quantity of food through new varieties of food? Uh, and in this respect, uh, the uh, plant variety regimes created under UPOF, the Union for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants, close to WIPO, the, uh, how uh, rights to food can be guaranteed through breeders' rights or through patents under Article 27 of the uh, TRIPS Agreement. Um, again, the same methodology, we have questions and we have a bibliography. There is also an open box in this, um, in this uh, small flyer on geographical indications that relate less to right to food, but right to quality in food, which is connected also to right to food, but more indirectly. So uh, there is just a box on it 
and perhaps later on uh, someone in our group will join us and work on how right to quality uh, is important and therefore may uh, connect to our work in these booklets. So this is basically uh, what uh, I have tried to do in two directions. Uh, nothing says that uh, uh, the three undersigns, undersigned wouldn't wish to develop additional flats. We loved uh, what we did together, so we may uh, create more, but uh, uh, I leave our chairman saying that if there are volunteers to do more, <laughs> we are much, much interested in uh, developing these leaflets because they are useful for um, colleagues and they may be used directly at class. And for, uh, that goes for uh, students, but also for public awareness. These are entry-level booklets. These are, this is an entry-level booklet and an entry-level series of leaflets. So uh, the objective is to present at a glance one topic that may be very complex, such as right to uh, uh, enterprise, and that may be more evident, such as right to, uh, to uh, access to health to a certain extent. So that's a bit the general philosophy that we are following in this group uh, under the leadership of, of Ulrika, Professor Venerstein. Okay, and then I have a case on a copyright and fair trial, and this can seem a bit odd, uh, because it's actually, uh, the basis is that we have had five cases on this in Sweden. Um, and uh, on occasion, lawyers want actually to um, hand in protected work, copyright protected work as evidence to court. And uh, it can be a screenshot, it could be a photograph, it could be whatever. And we have different, have different kinds of outcomes in, in the Swedish courts. Um, so it has really been a split, like split case law around this. And then finally, they decided to uh, um, actually ask a question to the European Court of Justice. So it came a case, I don't know if you noticed that case, to see 637-19-BY came last year. And um, it was based on the Swedish case where a defendant sent in a photograph as evidence in a civil case. And the question was if it was communication to the public. But they, the Swedish court also asked questions of could this be reproduction, uh, could this be for distribution, but they only got the answer on, on, on the um, communication to the public. And here we can see a tension between, of course, um, IP and fair trial. If you can't defend yourself by handing in this kind of evidence, it's, it's um, a, a big, um, I mean, a big hurdle for, for the uh, defendant. And the student should then reflect on if it can be an infringement to disclose protect material in court proceedings, and if, it, if the evidence can be opposed by uh, the um, plaintiff, for example, because it's an infringement. And I think this is, it's a bit not that, in a sense, fundamental maybe as f the right to food, but still it's very important for a person to be able to, to have fair trial. So that's one case. And uh, then I have a, a second case, copyright and the right to education. And we will start here from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I will, it also describes the International Covenant on uh, Economic and Social Cultural Rights. It also describes Agenda uh, 2030 and Goal 4 on education. And it also looks at the limitations in uh, the InfoSoc Directive according to Article 2 and 3, but also the new uh, limitation in the DSM Directive. So um, we have just got a proposal from our government how they will implement the DSM directive and I can see that we will have some, at least in Sweden, as I, my analysis is, problem with this. And it discuss actually not only the right to education but because the right to education is also the right to access textbook and educational material and educational material is actually copyright protected. 
So um, normally it's a, like a top-down way to understand the problem. Um, and I want also the student to reflect on, on, on the other way around. And also there's some interesting articles on what the criminal sanction in TRIPS does for uh, actually the right to, to education. Uh, and it's the same, so we will, it's actually information and then there's some reflections and, and, and questions. So this is the cases uh, now. And if you then want to contribute, uh, of course, yes. Then a new idea came to me yesterday. Uh, because I thought it was so interesting uh, about this that um, what was said last, uh, yesterday, and my idea was, shouldn't we do a booklet, like an inventory of university teachers' IP, and we just can describe it out of our different jurisdiction and put it together in, in a leaflet, like a, a benchmark study of uh, teachers' right? Because uh, today, teachers' right and academic freedom is... Um, something that have to be discussed more, I would say. Um, so uh, that is more like a proposal for this group to do also. I, I want to hear your re reflection also on all this. So thank you for our, your attention. Questions? There are questions? Uh, Ulrika, you want to, uh, I don't know if there is a debate or some of you want to ask us. I think there are some questions online. I heard. Uh, uh, you've seen some questions live, okay. I, I heard some sound. Uh -huh. It could be so, that I didn't have enough no, no, coffee, no, 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 so I'm no, no, no. stuff. It happens. So, no, no, it's never too much for me. Okay, yeah. yeah. I see the balloon. So, yeah, there. yeah, I yes. see something in the Papa? chat. Alison. Okay, Alison. Uh, Alison Ray. So I, I let you, as chair of the session, read, or you want to read? We have questions from Hamilton. Yeah, I love the idea of case studies from designers from different countries, even perhaps leaving the legal discussion open ended. That would be great for regular IP students looking from topic to write about as well as offering discussion topics for fashion and design students. Inspiring topics, thank you. A propose of Laurent's remarks that IP and food booklet is entry level. This is also so valuable in providing topics for small groups to take to a higher level of legal analysis. If I'm May I comment uh, yes, on this? Yes, actually, all the little booklets, all the flyers in the booklet are entry level to a certain extent. They are a getaway that then permit each uh, um, academic or student to develop a more complex work on it. So on this, we, uh, um, this, this is basically the idea. Clearly enough, some of the six topics are less entry level than others. Uh, and that's the nature of the considered fundamental right. So that was a bit our, our idea. And I think this, this replies to uh, uh, Alison's uh, uh, comment on which I was quoted. Yes, Claudia? Oh. Here? Otherwise? No? Yes, yeah. it does, it does. Yeah, I was wondering about deadlines, because, you know, I, I get all the time from my students asking me desperately for topics for their PhD proposals. <laughs> so this is something really amazing, what you are bringing, and, and I was listening and thinking, oh, that would be great for us to do that. So, well, what is the, um, the, uh, pr the estimated deadlines for when are you going to publish or when are you going to start distributing um, that we can then disseminate? Thank you. 
Um, when it comes to the street art project, that's only, I mean, we haven't re really started that yet. So um, I would say uh, we will probably do that work during 2022. When it comes to the uh, um, textbook on fashion, I will also think that that will be finalized during 2022 because uh, we have still a lot of chapters to write. <laughs> and, and I will also say that if, if someone wants to write a chapter that's my name on, you, you, could actually, you could actually just tell me because then I can hand one or two chapters to someone else. <laughs> so, um, and also when it comes to, so, so the one that's more, um, we can see, we have finalized the six projects uh, in that booklet, but still we want to have six more. It would be great. So if we could have, it's, and it's only like five pages, so it's not that long. Uh, so if someone wants to contribute, including the bibliography, so it's the five pages including yeah, including the the, the, the the reading materials and the questions and so on. So it's uh, like four pages. Yes, Let's get introduction and then yeah. It's just, it's just uh, the whole idea is to throw in. Sorry. The the whole idea when we talked about it, please uh, contradict me if I'm wrong, uh, was to throw in questions. So it's not about giving replies, also because it depends, right? It's just to uh, throw questions. And as the professor was saying, this is basic entry level. Although, of course, I would say that as you go through each subject, then it becomes more and more complex. As I think that the one on traditional knowledge really proves, right? So. Uh, until we get to questions that are, I would even say, almost intractable to some point, right? So the issue there is it's not, a, I would say, a huge commitment, and uh, it's fun because it's, it's also, it has brought us, when we were talking during the groups, to scratch our heads a lot and to really think about all the things that relate also to our work in general, both as teachers, researchers, uh, consultants, whatever. It's, it's really interesting also under this perspective. Yeah. Professor Mandier? Yes, if I may, uh, in this respect, yes, I mentioned entry level, but of course in each public, in each of these flyer, the, the level of sophistication is growing. So uh, then coming to Claudia's comment, there, uh, from there, one uh, teacher or student can identify avenues of other researchers. So this is the way we constructed it. And this is why it, it was so much fun in the working group, working together, because we, we, we really made brainstorming on how we conceive the product. And then on each of the six ones, we discussed how this is constructed. So this is really something that, uh, uh, for which we are grateful to Ulrika and for which really, really we, um, uh, we, we worked in, in, with the team spirit and were able to construct something multi-layered in a way. So uh, uh, it's five pages. It is, yes, I would say four of text and one of questions and bibliography, basically. So uh, this is the, the conception. By the way, uh, uh, we know already that this inspires us for further research, or this is connected with a few researches we have uh, made. For example, in my case, in The Right to Food, it was connected to a, a, a book uh, that won the prize of the Francophone States, and so on. So it's, we connect it to other activities where we squeeze something or, on the contrary, something on which we prepare uh, ourselves for perhaps later on expanding. So it is also part of our work of, our work of academics. So the, the effort we made, the three of us on this, is in any case will be productive here and elsewhere. So that's why we really encourage you to, to be next to us and join the, the group. But to come back to your question on the, on, on the time on, on this booklet, should we say like uh, around uh, New Year? Or? New Year was the idea, yes, New Year. So uh, for having an, an ESBN uh, of 2022, but we, 
we want already that it goes printing now. So we have it in reality. Yeah, we have it. We basically. have already the chapters in reality. It's just that yeah, yeah, yeah. we were talking about enlarging it because it's just the three yeah. of us and so, but the chapters are already written and drafted. We have them. It's, it's, it's finished, basically, yeah. It's also the issue connected with the printing and the format and so on. So. And how are you thinking to, uh, how are you thinking to distribute this material? I mean, the, the booklet on fundamental rights, um, is going to be over now. Is everything going to be an open source, or it's going to be on the web page of the IPTN, or we, is it already we, available? For it, instance, the booklet on fundamental rights. It's 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 not. Oh, yeah, you can. Ask. It's not it's not available yet. It will be by the end of the year. Clearly enough, being an open network, so it will be printed. And there will be printed versions. We haven't discussed it in, in the working group, but it's self-evident that it will be available through our website in a format which may be not the same as the printed one. But this, this, it goes with, without saying it that uh, we are working for the common good, so it's not something on which we make no, no. <laughs> money so we have, or, yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And we have, we have just, uh, so actually we have just looked at ways to print it actually at my university and it's more like they print and then it's, it's uh, a self cost so it's, um, it's not um, yes. in a sense anything that we actually earn money on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's really something for, uh, for the good in this area. Yeah. And we also have support for this. If, if I may add, it's uh, to going to uh, both points. I think it may be interesting also to interact, of course, with students because in reality, today students are, even if they're going to be lawyers, they're going to teach. So it may be useful also to engage with them because APTN is teachers. So here I'm trespassing my because, of course, um, but I, I, I think it's still uh, very interesting because in the end, it's something that it's not an exercise that is done only for us, though it's interesting. Because as legal scholars, oversimplifying is difficult and it's always a good exercise to learn to convey a message in a clear, concise, and compelling way. I think that's very important. But it's always very good to interact with, with, with people who are gonna be tomorrow's teachers in any kind of position, so. And, and we have some students here, don't we? Yes. That's yeah, so, so, so we, can, we can hear your opinion maybe. <laughs> If you want to, if you want to, of course, I will not force you. Okay, we have senior students, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> No stress. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> so okay, other comments or questions? No? And and on on the new idea? The benchmark of uh, teachers' rights? Just to think in. <laughs> This is a fundamental right, really. Yeah. So, uh, especially with the issues connected now with uh, the online uh, uh, activities, this is something that is really at the heart of our mandate. We have discussed it already, as you remember, at the online conference last year. This is something that is worrisome. Uh, teaching online means uh, uh, ways of self-control and self self-restraint that is uh, highly worrying. Uh, some universities leave us a lot of freedom. Some others uh, practically uh, put us like a button in a, in a system. So, uh, so it's quite uh, it's, it's a worrisome issue. So Yeah, I, I can, just yes, before I, the, I, the, the airplane took off, uh, I w was, I think I I uh, described it to you. I don't know. Yeah. So I um, saw a, an article in, uh, because we have one periodical that is like the university teacher. 
it's the, the name of the, in Swedish. And it was a description of a case at one university in Sweden that had, or they thought that they owned the right of the teacher's material totally. So this uh, person, this uh, teacher had actually left the university and he had uh, done some lectures online. And they wanted to continue to, to use the, these lectures, but they also wanted to force him to update the lectures uh, after leaving. And this is really interesting, I would say. So I think uh, it, it is, uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it is, it is really important issue of teachers' rights. So, and, and we have the opportunity as we have representatives from, from all over Europe almost, so we could do something amazing work on just the description of, of, of the rights actually. If there are no other questions, we will uh, uh, break the session for a second, but just one second. We are a bit late on our program, but I think this morning we have only fascinating presentations. So, uh, like, like yesterday as well, actually. So, uh, we, uh, we shall just break for one minute, just technically, while, uh, while Claudia uh, settles her slides, and uh, immediately onwards we'll... Uh, uh, go for onwards. We may have a uh, 10 minutes delay for the coffee break, but this is no big issue. We are a group of friends. <laughs> you can upload them as well from here. Yes, but if you do compartir archivios, está mejor. Yeah. Do I let you organize it. I just rush to the classroom one second. Huh? Eh, compartimos pantalla porque los hemos dejado. Esta la puedes cerrar, creo, ¿eh? La puedo cerrar, ¿no? Sí, 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 sí. La puedes cerrar porque esta también. Y la hemos dejado aquí, yo creo. Era esta, ¿no? Sí. Se come, se come, se come. Voy a compartir la pantalla para que se vea en grande. Tenemos que hablar tú y yo para que te hable español, ¿verdad? Sí. Perdón. Quería invitarte con los estudiantes para presentar estos temas. Porque ahora hay un par de ellos que quieren, están buscando temas y creo que les inspiraría muchísimo hablar contigo. Sobre todo el tema de The Link with con propiedad intelectual. Eh, y justo es que tengo una reunión la semana que viene con uno de ellos para, para hablar sobre temas. O sea, es que Tengo tu tarjeta, pero yo no tengo la mía conmigo, porque... Mándame un email, a ver mando si es que vos... Porque... So, dear participants, dear friends, uh, we have uh, 
now a very, very special uh, moment. Uh, and we have with us Claudia Tapia, who uh, is the uh, chair of uh, 4IP, 4IP Council, which is uh, the European organization that supports research in IP. Uh, they also uh, support us as the IPTN, and we are very grateful to them for this. Uh, also, uh, as uh, they much respect our academic freedom, which is something so important. We have really the special honor to have Claudia. Claudia Tapia is, uh, is a star in the IP family. <laughs> she is a star of the IP family, a worldwide star. She comes from, uh, originally from Argentina, but she grew up in Spain, and uh, she lives uh, in Germany. She worked in uh, uh, the most prestigious tech companies uh, of the moment, BlackBerry, when BlackBerry was the top of the top. And to my opinion, it is still the top, okay, uh, uh, <laughs> in a way. Uh, and she was uh, the head of IP uh, there, uh, worldwide, the director of IP. Prior to doing this, she uh, uh, graduated at the University of Valencia. She did an LLM. She did a PhD uh, at LMU in uh, Munich. And as such, uh, all what she has developed as a business professional is based on her strong academic uh, work, academic research that she has conducted. And this is why now she is uh, the uh, worldwide director for Ericsson, uh, for IP and ac legal academic at uh, Ericsson. Uh, it's something fascinating because technology companies are really uh, uh, considering, well, the most clever technology companies, are therefore uh, really considering the importance of uh, academia and law for uh, an IP law for the development of their tech business. And uh, uh, Cl Claudia is clearly at the hub of this. So this is why we are so happy that she's with us today. Uh, uh, this is one, uh, uh, like for most of us, one of her maiden trips after pandemics, uh, if we can say after, but uh, in any case, it's one of her maiden trips rather than normally she was always, uh, she had always a lecture all over the world. So we are so, so happy that uh, she has the time to, uh, she had the time to be with us today to present precisely uh, Academic Industry Corporation uh, uh, connected with uh, what 4IP is doing. Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me here today. It's, it's a real pleasure, not only to be in this amazing city, which is uh, for me always like holidays, but um, also to have the opportunity to, to talk to you, to hear your, your perspective, because uh, we are all involved in, in our day-to-day -day business from the industry side. And um, for me, it's, it's, um, it's kind of holidays, I have to say. I don't feel like working. Uh, I, I, I feel enriched with, with this, um, this change of, of views, with getting new ideas to bring them back to, to the industry um, area now. And uh, I wanted to, to tell you a little bit uh, about, about my journey. And it started um, some years ago when I, I was lucky enough to, to get a scholarship at Max Planck Institute uh, in, in Munich where I, I was doing my, my PhD and I had access to this amazing library, uh, one of, I believe, the best of, of the world. And I had hours and hours of time to go deep into a topic to discuss with these professors who were like walking encyclopedies. And it was really an amazing experience. I, um, I wrote that thesis. I, I came with my conclusions. I had some recommendations. But I had this feeling of, did I get it right? Is it really something that industry can lay down apply? And how could I know? I didn't have access to any of the licensing agreements. I was not in those meetings where companies were having their strategies. I had so much information that was missing. 
Um, so, but I somehow wrote it, published it, and I started right away to work for BlackBerry. And suddenly I was able to connect the dots. Somehow I was able to have access to all these agreements, to talk to all these people, to understand the concerns. And there it came with this irony that I was suddenly understanding so many things and I could not talk about them because a lot of it was confidential. Um, so when I had the freedom, I didn't have the knowledge. When I had the knowledge, I didn't have the freedom. So that was uh, kind of frustrating as you can imagine. Um, the, the other thing I realized in the industry time was that because we are having one project after the other and we're kind of running from one place to the next one, I didn't have the time to go in deep into the topics. I could not really see what are others thinking about this, what are maybe other sectors um, or the areas of IP um, coming into maybe similar challenges and how can we connect. Um, so I had all these, these issues coming and increasingly I was having this idea uh, of how I wanted to connect more with industry and, and academia, how enriching it could be for both sides to do that. Um, so one day I was, um, I was in an organization uh, meeting and um, we were in the break time and I was talking uh, uh, with the at that time Saipo of uh, Ericsson. And I was telling him like my vision and what we need to do and how we need to do it. And um, the parts that I like and didn't like of how industry co uh, collaborates with, with academia. And, um, and he looked at me, was smiling and saying, Claudia, we opened a position last week and you're literally describing it. Don't you want to apply for it? So this is how it came to, uh, kind of my journey into um, this, this collaboration and, and exchange of, of ideas with, with the uh, academia. And um, I realized I'm not the only one. So we had also other companies um, thinking that it was important to collaborate, that it was important to, to provide um, solid empirical um, studies. Uh, so that also decision makers can take decisions based not on lobbying, but truly on facts. But that those studies should also need to get exchanged with industry. Um, so that the results are so, so something that can be feasible uh, in practice. And Axel will talk much more about it, so I don't want to go into deep into now. You need to be a little bit patient and you will get from Axel uh, how, how we work, what we are provided. But um, I, I can tell you in part that at the beginning we got a lot of skepticism. It's like, industry coming to you, what do you want? <laughs> we are independent. And, and somehow it was kind of hard uh, because I was not used to that. It was used to us academic uh, having everybody willing to talk about topics. And uh, so for the beginning, <laughs> it was a little bit uh, uh, harsh, I have to say. And, but we also found uh, others who were very curious and very happy to talk to, to industry and where we could establish a dialogue. Um, and sometimes we realize we have similar views. Sometimes we have exactly the same views and sometimes we agree to disagree. But in any case, we all, well, at least I felt that um, we were enriching from this, um, from this dialogue. Um, we started to give some lectures in different uh, master uh, studies where, where we try to bring which are the challenges that we face from the industry point of uh, side. And um, mainly those that I give are, are related to digit digitalization and how IP in particular patterns and, um, are playing a role in standardization and try to do it into as much as practical as possible for, for the students also to, to understand why they are studying uh, all this AP. Um, we, uh, I, I mentor also uh, some uh, master thesis in the Technical University in Berlin. Um, we are invited uh, in Frappy Council to join uh, events as participants and uh, sometimes as, uh, as speakers. Uh, developing together maybe webinars. Um, so there are a lot of uh, ways uh, to, to collaborate and, um, and 
um, yeah, I think that since we started to do it, um, we got a, a lot of um, attention because we, we make everything free available. Uh, so it's free access, people can um, obtain that information anytime. And the other thing that, that we were considering important is the, um, the internships. How do we attract uh, the talents? How can we make this link between um, the importance of academia, but also the importance of connecting with industry when doing research? And, um, and we wanted to attract those who are, have um, law or engineers or economists. Um, ideally, they, they have finished the studies and they're doing a kind of master. Um, and they come to, to Munich for, for six months, uh, starting on the 1st of October and the end of, of March. And we thought, well, how are we going to do it? Um, the first thing that I found very relevant, and we discussed it with other members, and they also thought so, is to find important questions, relevant questions. Uh, questions that we can do something after that from the industry side, but maybe things that we see that policymakers are starting to analyze. This is information that sometimes academics don't have because we meet them more regularly, um, so we kind of see what is coming. So try to identify one of, of these questions. Uh, that the students also get engaged, that they feel this is, has a use <laughs> of, of doing that. Um, second is to pay them a, a decent um, salary. You know, we saw that um, very uh, internships, they, they get a uh, couple of uh, hundreds of euros or, or even nothing. And um, so I fight very hard internally <laughs> to, to make them understand this is a, a special profile. We are, and it's not fair, and I don't want um, to have people come into Munich, only those that come from rich families that can uh, pay that. I want to have the access uh, and the talents. So we came out to this amount of, of 2,000 euros gross um, that, that uh, we pay monthly uh, to the students. It's not that they are going to be rich in Munich, but they definitely can have uh, a decent flat and, and and be, um, have a nice experience and not to ask for, for, for money to anywhere. Um, and then the, the third part that we thought it's very important is to prepare them independently on whether they are going to go to academia or whether they are going to industry. Um, we want to offer a package that at the end of these six months they feel that they improved uh, where they are. So, we first uh, spent some days into explaining how to write academic papers. Um, and this is something that I had to learn <laughs> at the beginning because I felt that, you know, they're coming from universities, they have done masters, they have done master thesis, for sure they know how to write papers. Um, but then when I, in, in the process, um, of selection process, I, uh, one of the things that we asked them is to send us some, some papers that they have written. And, and uh, we have this process where we have different people looking at different things to making sure we are not biased and, and that we have several independent views on, on that to select the, the, the students. And I, feel, I felt that there were things that were truly missing and I didn't feel that it was because they were um, lazy or because they were not um, or they were not intelligent enough. Uh, I felt that nobody had explained them. So we spent time first to explain how academic papers are to be done. We made also a lot of exercises uh, with also an active speaker um, to, to explain some expressions in terms of structures and the typical mistakes of young academics so that they uh, get um, a, little, a little stronger basis before they start writing. And then um, we, uh, we do all these kind of mock situations like um, I give them some papers um, from, from a topic from different views and then um, they sit together like a typical panel uh, where you have the moderator and the speakers and uh, half of them are, or, or two of them are, have one position and the other has the other position and they, they have to present the presentations and they have to defend in the Q&A and then we do a switch 
which means that the same people who were representing with him now have to say the, <laughs> the opposite view. Uh, so they learn uh, all these techniques on, on how to present, how to defend your position, how to make sure you, you bring your arguments, but not in an aggressive way, um, and in a convincing way. Um, the techniques on, on also management. So we have external speakers, internal speakers that come to them, or, or nowadays a lot goes uh, online. Um, but that they can explain them what are the experiences in management, what do they need to consider if they are uh, working in teams, but also when they work independently, uh, how do they deal with, with conflicts uh, management, how do they ask for a raise, for example, um, how do they um, deal with, with a colleague who is not sharing information, uh, all these kind of conversations which are very important in working life and somehow they don't have the, the experience, and, and I realized from myself, I wish someone would have explained me all these things. So I, I came to what I would wish for someone to have explained me when I was young, and so I wouldn't have done so many mistakes, I'm having to learn from my own mistakes. So that's what we're trying to, to offer them. Uh, of course, also important things like how to do networking, um, and. Um, but content too. Uh, we have made an expert of artificial intelligence coming. Uh, we have a native speaker explaining then how to write uh, proper emails and, and communications. Um, we have people coming and sharing stories. Uh, for example, last time we had a, um, a former intern explaining to the students how she got this amazing job in Singapore and how she managed to get a 30% increase from what they wanted, applying the techniques that they learned in the workshops. So I felt that we, we need to have these people before so that when we start the workshops, they are all <laughs> really listening very carefully what we, uh, what we explain them. And, um, and I try to combine people with a lot of experience coming, but also with young talents because I think that they listen much more when they get people like Pat uh, Maurizio coming to them and, and Ruben, uh, so they are both invited, you know, <laughs> and now it's public, so you cannot say no, <laughs> um, to come and, and then share their experience and, and the path, and, and I think it's very inspired for, for them to, to do that. Yeah, so they, this is a, a serious IP game that uh, we organize. Um, and uh, what they learned to do, um, to deal with time management. Uh, they, they had a lot of fun. They, they have to agree also in the strategies and then they go into a, a strategy and they get information, you know, like real life, and then realize with the information they cannot longer have the same strategy. They need to then change their priorities and they have a lot of fun and they learn also a lot in, in, this, in this process. And one of the things that, that uh, we offer is kind of a coaching uh, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, reason being that I realize it's always with this group that at least half of them, they're a little bit lost where they want to go. Um, and I think that just telling them, do this, do that, is first not my place. And second, I don't think it's the way to help them. But uh, helping them to think loud um, and, and given them kind of food for thought. So a mentorship, coaching process is for them very helpful in, in this way. We also work with VCVs and, and the mock interviews um, so that they feel more comfortable when they finish this internship to, to present themselves and, and to know better what they want to, to do after that. And this year we have uh, all kind of nationalities uh, from Zimbabwe, Brazil, Italy, uh, France, uh, Bangladesh. Um, I think I'm leaving. Uh, I'm leaving one. Ah, Philippines. And um, every year is different. It's about the talents. It's not that I'm picking one of each, but uh, since I teach in several universities and, and they are usually international programs, um, this this time we we, ha we have this constellation. Um, so, yeah, and this is how uh, we are trying to cross the bridge <laughs> and, and make sure that maybe we, we are both going into the other side and, and try together uh, to build something that, um, that somehow uh, could be a win-win situation because we from industry don't have 
the time uh, and the knowledge to go in deep into some of these topics. We definitely need universities um, to do that. But I feel that universities will also benefit from, from having more exchange with, with industry, and that's what we are trying to, to do. And that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs>uh, the, not only the professionalism, but also the personal generosity of those who uh, lead uh, for IP is, uh, should be uh, recognized and a tribute should be paid to it. So I would wish to open the floor to uh, questions. Uh, and uh, Patricia, you have the microphone? Right here. Yeah. It is open? Okay, fine. I think so. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I would like to inquire a little bit more about the internships. While you were speaking, I was Googling. <laughs> um, so I can hear the experience. And you answered one of my questions, which is, did you accept foreigners, no Europeans? And from the flags, I, I noticed that you do. But what is the process? Does my university need to be collaborating with you already? Or how does it work? Thank you. No, we, um because we, we uh, really try to attract uh, talents, but we have a limiting sources, um, we usually do it per recommendation that they can apply. So either, um, most of the cases has been because in, in the time we were teaching, we identified some talents and we encouraged them to, it's kind of, I don't know, you, you teach yourself, you are in the classes, you see those who are, kind of really willing to learn, who have read the material that you have given them, who, who are interested in the topics, and those are usually the ones uh, when I teach that I encourage them to apply. Um, when professors tell me I have these amazing uh, students and maybe pick some of them, um, please send me the CVs. <laughs> I'm super happy to get talents and, and we don't have like a, like a, a number that we have every year. Like, Last year we had, I think, five. Did we have five? And this year we have, actually we had seven, um, support for seven because I identified seven which were so good I, I couldn't choose. <laughs> and we were having discussions with Axel and, and he was like, don't make me choose. And they are like, all good. So because this is the internship between um, Ericsson and Friday Council and, and we were feeling that it was important to have this. Um, but uh, we don't make just a number and then we try to get the number. We try first to get the talents and then we see whether we can have the budget for, for those. And so to make it short, I'm just talking too much. Uh, please, um, let's exchange uh, emails. And, and if you identify students, uh, send them to me. What I definitely will try to avoid is to have um, publicity and getting hundreds of of CVs because I will really not have the time to, to have a fair process. Um, and I like to read the papers. I like to, to talk to them one to one and, and to have other people in the interview and, and have well else looking at the papers so that we can, and it takes time. When we go all this process to make it sure it's not biased and it's, it takes time and, and that's why. Um, but, but yeah, if you identify, please. Please send them to me. Any additional question? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I just want to know if there is a, a certain limit of age to apply or to be an internship. Because, for example, in Mexico, sometimes it's different uh, the process mm -hmm. to apply because they have like a limit of age, and I'm not sure if it here is different or 
thing? No, it's, we don't have any. Um, the, uh, to give you an idea, last year we had a judge uh, from Pakistan, so she had been doing years on, on working as a judge, and then she got this scholarship at Max Planck Institute in the master studies, and when she finished in, within that internship um, program, um, she did the internship with us. So what is important is that the university, and I guess that's the most important thing, um, that, that you are a student. So you need to still be enrolled. Uh, so we have seen, for example, uh, university extending a bit the, the time so that they can be between the October, because we are starting 1st of October and we finish at the end of March, that, the, uh, that the, all this time you are still enrolled in the university. Um, and the second thing that I, I found more challenging in Spain um, has been the contracts. What I mean is that um, we have one university that, that works with a with, um, provider um, and charged a lot of money to the student and to us for, for just having this contract with a very painful process and not even one person to contact. It was always a, a system that we had to send just paragraphs. And, and so it was a nightmare. And uh, to the point that I said, I'm not going to do more internships from that university uh, because I, can't, I don't have the resources in the, in the association to have someone fighting for one month to, to this. And I don't think also fair for the student because if he has to pay so much to that part, then the amount is really low for being in Munich. So, but I think that if for, for the student side, if you are engaged to make sure that university is offering, you know, just as many others, one contract uh, between university and the uh, association with an internship and not throw it to someone else and nobody's taking care of it, um, then, uh, then it will, will work. So if you are selected, um, that should definitely not be the problem. So, but I don't want to extend it to the whole of Spain. I've seen some universities super prepared and others not. So, thanks. Any other comments, questions? Any additional question, comment? Um, yeah, Joe, please. Yeah, thanks, Claudia. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I think it's not a question more or a comment, but I think the focus on soft skills is really, really important um, because we have students at the University of Portsmouth um, who study IP. Um, but I think where there is a gap is, as you were saying, you know, I wish you were saying, I wish I had learned some of the sort of mistakes you made at the beginning. And that really resonated with me. So I think the internship program from that point of view would be really good. And it's great to see them later on. Like we had uh, one of the students, uh, Marta Duque, who is absolutely brilliant. And she was given a presentation last time. And she was sending me later on the, the feedback of, of people. And I was so proud, you know, seeing her apply, you know, these techniques. And uh, so it's, it's really nice to see later on the students how they they develop. It's, it's really a solid days. <laughs> okay. I am just uh, sending a message to the uh, speaker. Uh, the next speaker will be online since I don't want to interrupt the debate with Claudia and we will delay slightly the coffee break by, uh, by 15 minutes. Uh, are there any additional questions? In the chat I see none, but do we have additional questions in the room? Maurizio Krupi, Bocconi and Alicante. It's more a comment than, rather than a question from my side. I think it's also uh, very well appreciated the fact that you take care also on, the, on how much you pay for, for, this, for this experience. Um, so, so many times internships are really poorly paid. I remember I applied, as we were discussing yesterday, to the, the Court of Justice, and I sent like 15 emails, I got replied positive to 10 of them, and seven said like, oh yes, we are really glad to take you for free for six months, and I said, oh my god, that's really impossible, simply impossible, so I really appreciate it. Yeah, 
and, and I can tell you that it's not only the money, it's also the way you treat. You know, when I, I had this interview, I take the interviews and then I call everyone. Um, because I felt so bad when, when either people don't answer to me or, or they send me this kind of standard email. Um, so I understand if you're in a company and, and you have to deal with hundreds, you cannot do it. But, um, so I call everyone for me with something which is clear. And people were so thankful. Um, I think they are used to be treat, treated because they are young, uh, like not with the respect they deserve. So I think it's part of, of creating and, and attracting new talents is to treat them with the respect they deserve. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Any additional comment? No? So I would really uh, uh, say that this, this is, uh, uh, we really feel in the academic community, for those who had the occasion to work with uh, for IP and with you personally and with Axel, that this is really a, a, an exceptional scenario of uh, such uh, uh, a gener generosity and interest to making the others blossoming. Mm -hmm. So this is something that uh, personally, uh, talking in my personal capacity, for which I really have a personal admiration and uh, I think uh, from an academic point of view this is something marvelous. We now formally break for coffee for, uh, we'll try to uh, start again at uh, 12.15. The uh, coffee is served in front of the uh, meeting room for those who are in presence. And for those who are not, who are online, we'll try to do a delivery in a way or another. <laughs> Have a nice break and we start with fascina pre fascinating presentations at 12.15. Thank you.
Japan to uh, our uh, IPTN group today. Uh, Shoichi, um, Shoichi Okuyama is the second vice president of AIPPI, the International Association for the Protection of Intellectual Property. Some of you are members. Uh, AIPPI is uh, one of the leading professional associations, but is also involved in some activities, in many activities connected to, uh, um, to education. And therefore, we uh, started to construct a bridge, a relation with, uh, with the AIPPI last year, and uh, under the new uh, chair, uh, under Judith's chair, uh, chair person now, we are super, super happy to continue and to understand, thanks to Shoichi, what uh, AIPPI does in education so that possibly synergies may be found uh, between what they are doing, what we are doing, and also what each of you in this room or uh, online is doing. So uh, uh, our big objective as, as EIPTN, an open network, the big objective of our committee is pooling forces, pooling resources for the common good. So at this very stage, I would propose Shoichi to uh, give you the floor, your uh, 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 role um, uh, in Japan and all over the world in paving the uh, high quality of uh, patent law and patent litigation is well known and we are really honored that you dedicate your uh, Saturday evening in Japan uh, to be with us currently. Shoichi, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, thank you very much for And, and also uh, organization for FICPI. And the, uh, uh, also uh, uh, my local university, uh, I teach uh, uh, introductory IT course. And, and I really appreciate uh, your invitation to uh, have this opportunity to talk in front of the uh, distinguished audience. And uh, uh, I, I didn't think about AIPBI uh, as a educational organization. And I, I, I've been happy with AIPBI for 30 years. And uh, it, it is, it is a, a, a yeah, I'm sorry, this, the, the, the the earphone is not working very well. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, what I was looking at as an AIPPI as a uh, professional organization and not, not, not an educational organization. But when the question came uh, from the uh, leadership of um, EIP, then, uh, I realized that everything we have been doing at the AIPPI is education. And that's why the title of today is Everything AIPPI Does is Education. And I, I, I want to explain how I came to this uh, conclusion. And the, uh, uh, what's, what we got to uh, the, well, it, it is a professional organization, and AIPI is a, the, the shorthand for the uh, French name, and uh, uh, it was created, uh, founded in 1897. Well, soon after the Convention, you know, the, the Paris Convention was first uh, concluded in 1883, and, and those people who got involved in that process uh, on, on the, uh, the private sector side, people got together and, and founded the AIPPI. And we'll be celebrating uh, 120 
fifth anniversary next year. Uh, well, well, since because of the, uh, the, the the funding basis of the uh, FDBI, we have to cross tie with uh, WIPO, EPO, and uh, also local uh, urban offices. And uh, uh, we, we try to improve the uh, the intellectual property protections throughout the world uh, through the, uh, the, the harmonization of the uh, global IT system. Okay. So the structure is that the AIDBI International is uh, uh, the offices are located in Zurich. Es que creo, and creo que uh, compartido. We have, uh, el archivo en vez de la pantalla y por eso no pasan las diapositivas. Sí, es que mi inglés es irregular. Sorry, you, you, uh, we, we, we can. Shoichi, we cannot see your slides. We only see you, but we don't see your slides moving. Eh, you must uh, share a screen, not you, file. You must share the screen sí. and not the yeah. file, yes. Es que si no, no pasa. Por eso siempre está la misma. Yeah, that's now. Now it has moved. Ahora sí. Ahora sí se mueve. Now, yes, now we are, an, we are watching the 2021 ahora, e, ahora uh, sí. re, uh, resolutions, yes. Y creo que se está escuchando el mismo porque está en dos ventanas. Sí, sí, sí. sí. Y se está escuchando el mismo mientras que sí. habla, se escucha otra vez. Un poquito, pero ni tanto. Yo lo dejaría este. Vale, so, we, 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 now uh, that you have done share screen, you should oh, click again on your PowerPoint and we will see the PowerPoint. You should click again on your PowerPoint. No. No. Open PowerPoint window. You should open your PowerPoint window. Yes, now it's okay. Thank you very much. It's just perfect. Thank you, Shoichi. Please go ahead. Yes. No. No. Yes. Yes, what's IIPPI? What you described? It's perfect. But we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, Shoichi, so please open your microphone. Yes, now we can see you, see you, but click on your PowerPoint. Yes, exactly. Now we see you in small and the PowerPoint in big. So it's all under control. So still we were able to follow uh, your, uh, your introductory words perfectly, that, as they were very tra transparent, even without the, the slides. Okay. So please go ahead. Uh, I, I have uploaded the, uh, uh, my slides, so you can just download and watch your own PC. With pleasure. So we can see the standing and committee. Are, yes. Uh, uh, well, Standing, standing committees that, that we have 25 of them, uh, all the standard um, subjects, including uh, uh, ADR, industry, paratechnology, and so on. And the, uh, 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 just yesterday, we concluded the, uh, uh, the IPPI, what we call Congress. Uh, that the annual uh, big meeting of AIPPI. And the, uh, each year we uh, conclude the resolutions. Uh, and this is a very unique process at the AIPPI. So what we do is, is, is uh, I, I think, not, nothing comparable in other organizations. So each year, we systematically distribute what we call multi guidelines. So, for example, uh, last year, we distributed the 
uh, is uh, for uh, questions uh, in the form of the working guidelines to the national groups. And, 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 and something uh, like uh, uh, study eight, uh, 40 groups and 40 collectives. And, and we, uh, uh, we create Yes, we can, we can, sorry, now there is another problem. We listen at you twice. Because you have two computers open. Yeah, no, that's okay, we muted one, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay, Shochi. Please go ahead. Excellent. We cannot hear you. Ah. <laughs> okay. He will come back. Que encienda el micrófono. Ahora. No, no, lo tiene que encender él. So you should open your microphone. Your connection is very good. We can see your slides, but please do open your microphone. Now it's okay. Shoichi? Shoichi? The floor is yours. Now it's okay. Back to connection. Please go ahead. Okay, we can see the PowerPoint. Yes, we do. I suggest not to touch anything now and just to move the PowerPoint and it will be all right. Uh, put into the uh, breakout rooms for the, the room and, 
they, they can uh, discuss uh, certain topics under the, uh, the leadership of the host and co-hosts. So this is the educational process, uh, entirely educational. Uh, and the, uh, uh, we have standing committees, uh, as I said, 25 of them, and the number of, of the members is increasing significantly during the, uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, program. And the, um, of course, we have uh, uh, different initiatives outside of the and we have preparedness. Uh, we submit position papers. Uh, while we are trying to uh, strengthen the uh, submission of amicus briefs, and also uh, the, uh, we use extensively YouTube uh, AIPPI channel is, is for the uh, uh, dissemination of uh, uh, seminars with the WIPO and other organizations. And we, what we started just a few months ago is AIPPI-TV, uh, uh, which is used for, uh, uh, well, uh, exchange of information among uh, members and national groups, but of course it's, it's on YouTube, it's open to the, the public as well. Okay. And then we have uh, law books and uh, uh, the most recent one is law of law data, uh, which is very challenging area uh, right now, but we already published uh, one significant book. And, and we uh, are trying to have a regular journal. We do have uh, newsletters, but uh, uh, we have most uh, scholarly uh, <coughs> journal, uh, which is published uh, probably quarterly, and, and more educational uh, programs that, that we are trying to come up with. Well, thank you very much. Um, the uh, uh, AIPPI is open for discussions. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity, and I, I wish I could have been able to be in Barcelona, which is a, a wonderful city, uh -huh. and uh, 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 probably through other uh, channels like uh, uh, internet or, 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 or uh, where we can start discussions, uh, what we can do together. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Shoichi, for being with us today. So uh, distant, uh, we are super uh, interested in uh, understanding what other organizations are doing, whether there are synergies or not. Uh, uh, we are, many of us are reading with a great attention the AI PPI resolutions that have an impact on the uh, way IP law is shaped and will be shaped. So that's why I think this is very important for all of us. I would wish to give the floor to our online audience and to our in-presence audience for any possible questions. No? And online, I should check in the chat. There is a new question. Okay. Fine. Just one second. I'm just checking. Okay, so uh, we are, uh, I have no additional question. Um, I uh, uh, just made a small mistake while presenting yourself. Since now you are the first vi vice president of AIPPI, for which we congratulate you. We are extremely uh, grateful of this, uh, of uh, the pass of discussions together. And for sure, we will further discuss with uh, the AIPPI board possible ways of cooperation. Uh, all our thanks for being with us. Please stay connected for the, uh, uh, as long as you want today, as much as it's not too late in Japan. And we have yeah. now two uh, absolute fascinating presentations on organizations that play a key role on uh, uh, the promotion of intellectual property education. So I would now uh, ask the two panelists to join us in presence in the, 
in the meeting room, Axel Ferrazzini and Patricia uh, Covarrubia. So we just break for 20 seconds, the time uh, they come to the, uh, to the room and to the screen. Thank you so much, Shoichi. Okay, while I leave Axel Ferrazzini uploading his presentation. The website. The, on, uh, on the website. We go directly on the website. Okay, and you do it from the website. Okay, so let me introduce uh, you, Axel Ferrazzini. I don't know if I should really introduce him since you already had many occasions to interact with him over the last days for those who are in presence, but for those who are distant, uh, I don't know as well if I need to introduce you since you are much known in the, uh, in the research community, in the IP research community. Axel Ferrazzini is the managing director of For IP. Uh, for IP Council, and uh, as such, plays a key role in making for IP Council uh, functioning, operational, in developing the program, in uh, uh, running under the impulse of the board the various activities. And uh, as such, he's in the front line as the uh, uh, manager of the organization. Uh, under uh, uh, President Tapia, the chairperson Tapia, he's the one who really makes uh, 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 a functioning of the activity and the programs super operational. Operational is exactly the sense of the life of Axel. Uh, we have a real pleasure today to have not only lawyers, we are all lawyers with our white bears or white hair, or, uh, not really, but, but uh, we, uh, we have with us a real scientist and an engineer. And as such, his scientific background, university background, makes that he has been in charge at uh, Blackberry and at Orange of patents and standards, of standardization of mobile uh, uh, systems. And as such, he is really at the, whereas we lawyers uh, very often uh, embed the technologies of the others, he is the one who conceives how technologies could be interactive and for the others. So uh, he plays a key role in understanding the relation between technology and sharing. He has worked and lived in various countries, in India, in Singapore, in, uh, in Germany, in, uh, in France, of course, and in uh, Belgium. And uh, he forms part of the uh, very international group present today. Axel, with this uh, very informal, if I may say, introduction, I uh, would wish to leave you the floor and thank you also for uh, all what you are doing for uh, education, for the youngsters, for the students, next to Claudia in this marvelous role. Thank you very much for, uh, for having us. I will try to, to briefly just explain not what 4IP is doing, but how we are uh, doing things. So I just said, I'm trying to implement, create, uh, based on what we can receive as feedback. So many of you uh, know that we are really open and transparent in what we are doing. And one of the goals is to, to be as diverse as possible. And uh, based on this, uh, for example, we are doing interviews, feature interviews of individuals, companies, uh, leaders. Uh, but the goal is to, to be as uh, as diverse as possible, and we have put the priority to interview more women, for example. Um, innovators, women innovators, showing the lead to inspire uh, the communities. That's one of the moves uh, 
we, we have we have taken the last uh, the last few years, and I would like to show something to bridge the gap between the academic world because you are the ones planting the seeds in the students' brain, which is great. But then when they go on the job market, they they have to realize that life is a bit different, and uh, they have learned a lot, but how can they really implement what they have learned? And at 4IP, we are trying to create tools. Tools that are very, for some people like you with the knowledge, that may appear to be basic. But they are not that basic because we have, when we started to create what we call the 4SME section, uh, because we are working with academics, uh, professors, teachers, uh, former students, and, and former judges and also policy stakeholders, we have realized that many basic notions of intellectual property rules are not well understood. Um, they learned, they passed exams, but then how to implement this, especially when you intend to create your own startup or contribute to an SME? Not all the students will join big companies We'll have assisting personals. Uh, we have people to, to guide them. Many of your students will actually join SMEs. That's more than 85% of European companies. And they will have responsibilities to develop, to contribute to development of the intellectual property rights of those SMEs. And that's even worse for the startups where one young student may join and be directly named the head of innovation. You know, and that's, that's, that's the reality. So we thought, let's get started with the, with the very, very basic things. Some of your students are learning in course, but then they will check the 4IP Council website just to have a more concrete point of view, understanding of how things are working. And if we start with this tool that is called uh, uh, the 4 SME section, uh, and when we say, what is intellectual property, one will say, that's written in the book. They can find it on, uh, you know, on the internet. But the extra step that we do at 4IP is we are guiding, not reinventing the wheel at all. We are reusing existing content that will help them to really grasp the, the small details to help them to do the implementation. And for example, on this tool, uh, you have those five tools Okay, patents, copyright, design, trademarks, and trade secrets. And for a startup, when you have this ideation process, you create the idea and say, I want to create a product or a service. If they go on this website, they will realize, in my opinion, in less than 25 minutes, where they might need to start with. Okay? Um, by just going through the different lines, they will say, step one, what do they protect? Then easily the, the, the young people, and maybe not so young, will understand, oh, I don't need patents, at least not now. Uh, maybe I just need to protect my domain name. So where am I going to start with? And then I'm creating a website. There is a design of the website. Can I try to do some protection of it? Maybe not, maybe yes. And then I want to create a product. Okay, fine, the product. Okay, what already exists? Do I need to look at specific uh, parts or uh, you know, um, specific details of what I'm creating to be different from the others? And this is the first step, that in just less than, hour, than one hour, uh, they can make their own decision. Because we are not creating uh, something that do not exist. We are referencing direct links to what already exists on trusted websites and, and placeholders. And at the end, we know that it is important to have an idea of how much it will cost. Uh, so we tried not to give legal advice because that's definitely not the role of IP. We are not doing this, but say, hey, you have an idea, you want to learn, we are here to assist. You take this information and then, once you will go on the other website, if you want to get Legal advice, you can, for example, contact the uh, EU IP help desk, or you can reach out to the EPO, and, and then you will nurture your idea and make your own decisions. 
So that's one part of the, the work. But then we had to uh, realize that we have to go one step further. Because your students are gra graduating with a lot, a lot of information. Uh, they know a lot of stuff, but maybe sometimes it's good to summarize and simplify. That's the same for the policy stakeholders. They have a daily job to do, but maybe they would like to learn more about specific types of IP, IP rights. And that's how we have created the four reasons to patent, the four reasons for copyright, four reasons for trademarks, for, uh, four reasons for design rights, and we are in the final phase to have the, the four reasons for trade secrets. Um, and how we have created this? You know, uh, one, uh, we are not a huge association, uh, but we have a very strong network of what we call the ecosystem partners. Organizations willing to work with us to develop something that will be useful for the community. And if we go uh, to the four reasons for pat uh, to patent, that's the basic, you know, we explain the basic, but then we have partnered with existing organizations. Here we have ESTP, the European IP Help Desk, the EPO, France Brevet, Greur, IPAN, EPIL. Those organizations were willing to help us by bringing information, examples, illustrations, something that could really make things more concrete. And that's the uh, make the IP fun again. Okay? Uh, it has to be colorful. It has to be something nice to, to, to look at. And in case I want to click, I will find what I'm looking for. We have split those projects in four reasons for a good reason, because they don't have much time. And if we start having something long, complicated, too detailed, that won't work. If they really want to go into the details, they can go back to their uh, courses, material, and that will be fine. With the, the, the four SMEs thing, as you can see when I'm scrolling down, um, when one wants to learn more, they can just uh, over the small bullets and they will discover additional details. So one will say, oh, market access, patents, market access, hmm, I'm interested in this. What does it mean? Leverage your research and development results. Oh, I'm a startup, I, I'm having R&D activities. Uh, it, it speaks to me, but I want to learn more. Can I have an example? Oh yeah, indeed. Uh, there is patent can be used to support business model extensions, blah, blah, blah. This is great, but if I click on this, am I going to, oh, there is an example, a case study. And that's where the EPO case studies are referenced. The EPO specifically selected a few of the case studies they have created to illustrate exactly the point that we wanted to make. So it goes through the, the four reasons. Um, I don't need to, to really explain, but uh, one of the, the key parts, um, as an engineer, I insisted on the fact that we need to connect the theory with the real life. And, and the real life is making money. Okay. We are not here to make money, but when you are building a company, you know that at one point you will need to, to pay the bills. So maybe IP could help you to create something that will help to pay the bills. And that's where we try to explain each time that's possible um, how you can raise money thanks to intellectual property. Many times it is ignored. Um, how you can increase the strategic value of what you are doing thanks to intellectual property. Uh, you don't need to monetize. We are not talking about monetization, but that's still an option. You, know? you need to be aware of everything that you can do to make the right decision. We are not influencing the reader. The reader is, in our opinion, wise enough to make their own decisions. And um, then, I will not go through the, all the, the different models, okay? But I would like to show you another thing that is quite uh, popular, is how do I use intellectual property to grow my business? That's the, the issue that we have in Europe, that's about scaling up, okay? 
we have a lot of smaller companies, we have a lot of people willing to create uh, more concrete uh, examples or illustration of what they would like to do, uh, but then they get stuck in small companies. They don't know how to scale up. And scaling up is not easy. But that's maybe where intellectual property can, can help. So that's why we have created, how do I use intellectual property to grow my business? And when you go on it, okay, that's the fun part again. Uh, that's not boring text and I don't need to read uh, 10 pages. I'm just going through the, the tree of possibilities. Going through this tree will help me to decide, oh, okay, exclusivity, enhance my reputation, uh, commercialization, attract funding. Hmm. Here I'm a bit interested in exclusivity, okay? So I will go through this, and as an interested person, I want to learn a bit more, not too much, but each leaf of this tree will allow me to learn a bit more. And um, through this, we receive very good feedback. People who said, oh, I went through the, the, the tree of possibilities, I understood um, I'm not interested in the patents, but the first step for me will be to make sure that I have the right design. I am protecting my design because this is the most important part. That's enough for us. We just are contributing small bricks to what they are building, and that's helping for IP to contribute to what you have done by teaching, us, teaching them really uh, the core knowledge, but then we just add up little pieces to make sure that it is illustrated. So in case um, you would like to, to steer the attention of your, your students to, to this, uh, everything on 4IP is freely accessible. And that's the key part of 4IP. We work with many different um, organizations, people, stakeholders, but at the core, we make sure that everything is freely available. And in case they want to participate or have questions, they can interact with us. Uh, I think that should be sufficient. Thank you very much, Axel. This is exactly what I had pre-announced. Uh, efficiency and functionality is really the key word for, for Axel. So making that IP uh, is a tool or not a tool, but understandably, uh, as, you may, as you quoted with the example of patent or design, making that uh, those who need to be guided, be guided in the right way. So congratulations for this. Any question from, from our in-presence audience or online audience? Uh, Ulrika, Ulrika, sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. this is a very good question, and thank you for asking. Yes, this is uh, a European point of view. Yeah. Okay, we're trying to really select the right information. But now that you are asking this question, um, the Irish uh, Patent Office took the entire content and they adapted it to Ireland. So that's the first step. What they, they, they ask us, um, can we reuse your content? Of course you can. And then they said, can we adapt it? Of course you can. They just took everything and they included examples for their country and pointing to information from their website in addition to what we have already created. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we are in, dis in discussion with the Swiss IP office uh, to do something a bit similar. We are trying to do it with INP in France as well. Our goal is to make sure that it is spread as broadly as possible. And if we can adapt it, if you see some information that could be adapted or added, we will be more than happy to include it. 
Thank you. Uh, Enrica, if I may. May I? Um, you can see that, for example, when it says, do I have to register it? It shows more information in EU IPR help desk. There is also Latin American um, IPR help desk and an Asian one that you can address your students to. Any additional, any additional question for Axel? No? In which case, I would give the floor to uh, Patricia, to Patricia Covarrubia. Uh, before, I would really wish to thank uh, you for the, really for this effective job that is done and that is so useful. Students, and in particular for the few, well, actually very senior students we have in the room, uh, we should remember, and for those who are possibly online, we should remember that uh, uh, university resources are very important. We discussed about libraries and so on. But at some stage also, resources made and made available by organizations that promote awareness, such ex exactly as for IP, are so useful for students, they, they, even if made for SMEs. This helps you touching the reality. The big issue for the university student is, as mentioned uh, earlier by uh, several speakers, finding or uh, crossing the bridge between uh, theory and reality. We try to do, it, to do it at the university. We should all, to my opinion, try to do it. For, for students, uh, separately from what we can do from, for research, where we should be sometimes in theory, uh, uh, it's very important to touch reality. So uh, resources such as the ones of 4IP are crucial. Thank you so much again. <laughs> Last but not the least, we have as speaker now, and perhaps I should switch to present you so that oh. you have the space closer to the screen. I'll switch with you. Buttons. And possibly even your buttons. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Need. So, yeah, okay. So, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Patricia Kovarubia who uh, has an exceptional background, a background of diversity, diversity in teaching, diversity in geography, which is so important for us, for uh, a European association. Patricia Kovarubia uh, is senior lecturer at Buckingham University in the UK. She has taught in many uh, prestigious universities uh, in the UK, such as Brunel and others. Um, she is uh, an academic who has the passion of dissemination of information and knowledge. And as such, not only does she work for the IPR SME help desk for Latin America, so uh, of the European Union, and this is something which uh, is very important, but also due to her Latin American origins, she is uh, uh, responsible for the uh, uh, IP Tango blog, one uh, which is rated uh, all over the world among the best blogs on intellectual property. So for Latin America, but above all, even at worldwide level. So. As such, by uh, running the operations of the IP Tango, she plays a key role in disseminating knowledge far beyond the university, but also for academics and for students. So this is why this is really so important. Uh, she also represents in this very room the uh, uh, together with Claudia, the uh, example of all what Latin America can bring to uh, uh, European IP. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. Um, IP Tango, what is IP Tango? It's a blog. But I don't see it just as a technology platform. 
I have seen something else. And I'm going to tell you my experience as a student here in Europe, in the United Kingdom, and then how I progress it and where I am today and what the blog has done to me and what it's doing at this stage to my students. We understand from the last decade and a bit more that blogs have been part of the communication technology, so much as a blackboard, Moodles, VLE, all the things that we are using at the moment. Now, we cannot deny that communication technologies are an essential element in the improvement of an open and flexible teaching learning. Today, I want to add a little thing more than that, which is inclusivity. And it's something that we in the classroom sometimes forget. So I'm going to tell you about why I am here. My name is Patricia Covarrubia. I'm from Venezuela. I am a minority in a classroom, British classroom. Perhaps here in Madrid, in Spain, you have many Latinos. But in Britain, don't. Okay? So I was a minority in a classroom. I also have a learning disability, although I don't say disability, because I am able to learn. I will say it's a difficulty, or as my daughter says, it's a pickle. Okay? So I have dyslexia. Uh, I have severe dyslexia, although I did my test three, day, uh, three weeks ago and it becomes as a mile, because I have used so many techniques nowadays that I know how to deal with learning. So you may notice that I got printers in papers, I got many colors, you have been speaking a lot, and I'm doing graphics and things in my sheets because that's the way I can retain the information. So otherwise, I will not be able to digest what you're saying. And Gabrielle, yesterday, and I'm going to say this is an anecdote, so you will understand what I do. I tried to send an email three times yesterday to the IT service in here. And the three times he returned like, this is not a mail, it's wrong. And I asked Gabriel, can you please help me? And he said, well, is that the M, the W is an M. And I said, all right, fine. So I send that again. So then he said, mm, the V is not a V, it's a U. Okay. And then again, he said, well, there is no a dot. Okay. So he said, I will help you. I will type it for you. And that's what I see as a difficulty, because we always have someone that helps in the way. And that's what the blog did to me. It helped me to understand better and acquire knowledge that I was not able to do. I mean, IP books, guys, come on, they are like this. As soon as I saw this, I said, I'm not going to buy that. I was scared. It's just too much information and as soon as I read one page, it's gone. Uh, I destroy, that's my husband's word, I destroy books. I have to do this, I have to put colors, I have to put post-its, like this is what it means. I have to do so many things. I indeed destroy a book. So let's talk about the IP blog. The use of blogs in educations. I don't know if you have heard of the imposter syndrome, which is when we start to doubt ourselves. And you're laughing because you, I guess you know what I mean, okay? <laughs> so I guess everyone in this room has suffered in one way or another of that. I did, of course. Doing a PhD, I got a grant, I got a scholarship, I started to doubt myself. Do they know what they're doing when they discover that I don't know how to learn? You know, are they going to take it away? Um, I thought maybe it's the language, maybe it's the grammar. I'm doing that in English. Come on, it's very difficult. And I got an email from uh, my tutor from my dissertation, uh, uh, which was in domain names and trademarks from the University of Southampton. 
and she said to me, have you heard of the blog IPCAT? Have you heard of that blog? It's an amazing blog regarding intellectual property in Europe. Every day you have like three, four news about it. And she also mentioned the IP Tango blog. And I said, well, I've never heard of that. I'm going to give it a, give it a try. IPCAD was founded by Professor Jeremy Phillips. And he also funded intellectual uh, IP Tango. So I started to follow it. And these are my three steps in a blog. I use it for educational purpose. Why? Because a blog is around 400, 500 words. I could read it, okay? The layout of a blog is easy for me to break it down. It has colors, it has subtitles, it has questions. So for me to read it, I didn't need it to take the whole day to read a page. It was bam, I got it. Here is the knowledge. So it was, that was my first knowledgeable thing that I could do without feeling, um, I wouldn't say stupid, but I guess you, you got it. It was really slow. So I think this is great. I'm acquiring knowledge. Here comes the second step. When you read a blog, it has comments. When I started to read the blogs, I was happy, I understood to acquire knowledge, but I couldn't understand the comments because they were a little bit of critical thinking, they were deaf, there was debate, discussion that I couldn't follow when I just started. So my second step was to, uh, to now having the knowledge, I can understand what is the debate about. And following the IP Tango, I was saying, okay, if this in Europe is like this, it works like this, this is the legislation, this is in practice, what is happening in Latin America? Why we borrow legislation that is not fit to us? Okay, you agree? Really, legislations are reflections of a society, and we borrow legislation. It's terrible. So I started with that critical thinking without realizing. And my third step was the reflective writing. I may have something to say, and I try it in those comments. Of course, believe me, I was, I was waiting for someone to make the comment first, okay? And then somewhere in there, I start as well to have an opinion, a suggestion about why these things are working here in Venezuela, in Brazil, they work in, the, in, in a different way. So the use of blocks in education for me was being part of a social and collaborative space. I feel enhanced, I feel empowered, I felt that I did have a voice, I have something to say. The whole process made me part of a community and of course I couldn't find any picture just in the middle. I didn't feel in the middle, of course. I was in a little corner somewhere. But uh, still, I did have a voice. So we may agree that blogs or any other type of communication technology is about knowledge generation that is accessible to everyone. The literature and the research, however, concentrates on just blogs or communication technologies as a learning tool. And I want to bring you today uh, what Ferdinand and Trammell mentions, which is that a blog promotes conversations, a blog promotes also active learning, better relationships between teachers and students, and also a higher order of thinking. If you can put that into the classroom, then that is a bonus because blogs are available for everyone. It's not something that you as a teacher need to be engaging. It just mention the blogs to your students so they feel part of a community. We love direct communication. That is a fact. Yesterday when I started to meet people, I didn't shake hands, but in the afternoon I was hugging Professor Manuel. Okay, so that, that's it, okay? So we love direct communication. But what we are doing today, we know that it's not feasible, we have to have networks, we communicate by emails. So that sense of community is something that we as a humans, we do need. 
because it's positively related to learning. Now, let's talk about the blog. When you open the IP Tango blog, this is what you see. Uh, dancing couple, that's our logo. That's what people see. We have the descriptors, the criteria we said. Um, it's a platform used to discuss IP matters in Latin America. So yes, it motivates learning and foster engagement. But this is why I see, okay? I told you I look differently because I have dyslexia. I always think inside the box. What I see in blocks is that we as a teacher can use them as a 4D reading. Why? If students nowadays, when we ask questions, even in the classroom, they Google it, okay? So rather than having my students to Google, I provide them respectable blocks. Uh, they are up to date that they may cover the region where they are coming from. My students in the University of Buckingham, 48% of them are foreigners. And when I say foreigners, it's not Europeans. So I really need to cater for them. 12% of my students in the lower school are dyslexic. Do you know how many students do you have in your class that have a disability? So it's important for us to understand how students are digesting the information that we are providing them. So the blocks, for example, I have here many people, I perhaps don't know their regions, so I will provide them for India, please visit the spicy IP, for Africa, please uh, visit Afro IP, for Latin America, please visit this, and so on and so on. Okay, so I leave that to them. I open also a forum on Moodle, icebreaker, like what do you want to be called, what's your favorite food, so I, perhaps I will not remember in the class who is who, okay, let's be honest, but I know that in my classroom is someone that is from Morocco. I will know that someone is from Mexico. I will know that someone comes from Zimbabwe. So when I am teaching, I can bring that, ooh, what will happen in Zimbabwe, for example? What are the news in Zimbabwe? Now, you may think, well, but if they are here in Europe, they come to learn European legislation. Duh, I did that, okay? I come in here, I came in here to study EU law. But I felt detached, because I was, well, this is wonderful, but it will not work, you know? It will not work in my country. So I felt, with the blog that I started to belong, that I started to have an opinion. But also, my classmates, European classmates, also started to appreciate other cultures. Rather than to say that, oh, because in your country everything they, is a copy, is a fake, they started to understand how society appreciates the things in my country. And that's why I welcomed yesterday when we were talking about traditional, cult, uh, traditional cultural expression, traditional knowledge, because that's what we in Latin America have plenty. And I felt, okay, let's talk about who is copying who, you know? And, and that gives you power in a classroom. And you have Europeans and Latin Americans and Africans talking. And you have that beautiful environment of inclusivity, diversity, and critical thinking. That's what we want, right? When we, we enter education, what's about critical thinking? But imagine if you have in a, in a classroom that friendship, that community. Learning from each other culture is about acceptance. It encourages personal reflection. It encourages collaboration. I use the blog as a channel for unique voices. Uh, Gabriel said yes to say, oh, you haven't published something that I sent you. I said, oh my God, I forgot. Or I, maybe in the junk mail, you know? It's about providing voices to everyone. Just an opportunity. I have something to say. But overall, it's about critical, analytical in our students' thinking. 
really says that if professor wants students to become autonomous, creative, helpful, and cooperative, we need to provide them with the spaces. We need to provide them with places to practice their skills. And we need to value their qualities, whatever the qualities are, but we need to value that. Let's finish them. I have told you what you see, what I see, and what in reality the IP tango block is. There are two key words in here. One is about educational engagement, assisted learning, and the other one is about belonging, the community recognition. And the photograph that you have in front of you is in Venezuela, we have a custom, and I think in Mexico as well, which is the quinceañera, the 15th. It's a big celebration for the girls where they get to get this puffy pink dress, long dress, and high heels. So imagine in London, okay? I live in a little village upside London. So to make a quinceañera, I invited all her friends, okay? And of course, we have the hora loca, the crazy hour, and we dance salsa, okay? And of course, all the friends were English, and she asked me, Mommy, can you please lead? So the person in front of the picture is me, leading all 15 years old to give her some steps dancing salsa. That is IP tango. It's about assisting people, but it's also for them to feel part of me in that case and my culture, but also I felt appreciated. And that is great feeling that you could have in your classrooms. We ensure with the IP Tango, we ensure widening participation, equality, diversification, inclusion, and fair access because it's free of charge. Anyone can be a member. Now, please don't be scared if some students feel uh, that they don't have contributions. Perhaps they feel afraid to say something in the classroom. Don't feel afraid of that. I was one of those. And I learned from it because I started to develop critical thinking. So just give them the opportunity for them to feel identifiable. This is me, Patricia Covarrubia, from Venezuela. I have dyslexia. I am from a minority, and I feel today great. So thank you very much for having me, Loang, and feel a part of a community of European teachers. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia, for this uh, insightful and warm presentation uh, uh, that brought a lot of energy, I think, for all of us in our own uh, souls and bodies. So I would wish to open the floor to questions. Uh, yes? I'm going to publish your article, don't worry. <laughs> So it's just three remarks. So first of all, thank you very much because this was really a powerful and uh, needed uh, message about uh, learning and improving that I think uh, all of us, some of us m with more difficulties of course than others do, but it was a really powerful and positive message. The second thing, and here I'm really frank with you, the email was very complicated yesterday. <laughs> it was really like full of dots, so <laughs> when I got there, it was so confusing for me as well. And, and just the third thing was a remark. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge fan, of course, of, of the blog. And uh, here I'm addressing, as I know that we have some students from Latin America, because I think that it really fills a void uh, from a region of the world, a continent, Latin America, that really has a lot to say and to do in terms of intellectual property in the sense that it's evolving. So I think that the, the blog is empowering people in, in two ways. On the one hand, to talk about it, but also to take information on, on what is happening. So I think it's really, uh, it, it's much needed. And it's, uh, it's, it's nice, not only for Latin Americans, but even for Europeans who want to engage, of course, in a dialogue with Latin America, because it's, uh, it's such a dynamic, of course, region of the world. And, and so I think it's also important to build bridges. Uh, and, and, and that's key. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. It was very, very powerful and interesting your presentation. I want to know your opinion about uh, as a former student and a current teacher about how, how do you, what uh, about your uh, what is your opinion about uh, how is the best way uh, for a teacher in order to know in a classroom the different uh, capacities to learn of the group because uh, at the beginning of some class sometimes we think that there are no different capacities it's just maybe a thing of is just like a, the way to uh, to do the things but there there are different capacities so what is the the best way to approach the group in order to identify who has different capacities that's an a very difficult question, <laughs> especially when we have rooms full of 100 students, okay? Um, one of the first steps that I do is that I contact a student welfare in the university um, because of data protection, they cannot tell me perhaps the names of the student, but I just want to be aware of if I have a, a student with any uh, difficulty. I did have a student with Asperger, and for me that was a challenge. But I, I just learned, I just learned, I have these students in my classroom, regardless, I don't point fingers to who they are, and I know how to deal with things. Uh, one of the things that I love about the previous presentation were about the charts. And when you were mentioning there are no boring tests, and it was, thanks God. And that's what I do in my class. I, if you see my PowerPoint presentation, this is the only one that has words, you know? And for, uh, let's say, IP that has very difficult terms and things like that, I will use one or two words in the PowerPoint. I don't write too much. First, because I'm bound to have mistakes because I do, when I write, have errors, okay? And also I use plenty of visuals in the classroom. Even without knowing that I have a student with a, a difficulty, because that's a way I can also explain my techniques. And you may think, well, it's easy for you because you already are suffering from, I'm well, not suffering, sorry, but yes, I sometimes suffer, okay? Um, what I do is I, I do once a year, I do training to my colleagues, to my staff. Um, I encourage not to write too much in the text. Uh, PowerPoint should have colors, they cannot be black and white. Um, Arial is a preferable text. Just simple details that you can give to your colleagues. And we all, we don't even need to know that there is a person that is struggling. We just approach them. And you also, yes, the first time in the lesson you will notice that, you don't notice that, but then you will notice that some, some are pulling apart behind things like that. Um, so you just can have on the corridor a conversation. Are you all right? Where are you coming from? Oh, have you read this case? You know, it's about one of the errors that I did. Okay, I have to say as well. I every time I entered to the room, for me the icebreaker was to talk about what is in the news. Okay, what is in the news? Of course, related to IP. Of course, we have so many cases going on, and and you will have someone referring to the cases. Um, that was my error, because there was no lesson. Everybody was discussing, which is excellent. We want that in our classrooms, to hear the student's voice. But then we, oh, we need to go to the basics, you know? So I then put it in the middle. Uh, again, no. So I, now I spend five minutes, okay? If they want to do during the break, that's fine. But the last five minutes is, what is in the news? And is there any news that we can apply whatever happened today? And, and, and that's the way that I try to engage more with my students, regardless of their uh, difficulty. Thank you. Very much. Any additional question? Yes, please. Uh, well, my question is about, like, if it's annoying for teachers when a student uh, asks a lot of questions or talks a lot, I, I, I'm asking this because uh, well, you were talking about uh, kind of disabilities and for example I have like a little problem with 
very uh, slow and uh, how do you say that? Like, um, yeah, like I I'm not so able to follow very long and slow classes because I get bored easily. So m many times I'm asking a lot of things or like I'm a really big fan of uh, like how do you say that? Um, like uh, like. Like curious facts or like like uh -huh, like fun facts or like learning with kind of uh, gothic facts or thing or things like that like more interesting or more uh, yeah like not so slow or not too plain. Yes. I'm not sure if this is. Yes, I have in my office <laughs> what is called by my peer in my office a box of rubbish. Okay, I have a box with all the rubbish that I can find about intellectual property. So any case that is out there, Kit Kat case, I'm going to get, of course, I eat a Kit Kat first, the chocolate, and then I put it in there. And I make sure that the students see the chocolate, touch the chocolate, and they know what it is about. We were talking yesterday about how can we, academics, regulate artificial intelligence, digital data, if we don't understand it? It, does, it doesn't make any sense. So I cannot tell my students, oh, key card, because you have to break it. Break it? How? So say, well, here is the key card. Tell me. Rubbing a bottle, you know, just rub a bottle. What is this for? I said, well, it holds bad. I said, oh, that's a technical issue, isn't it? You know, you just have to become more, you said the book legs are basic. We have to be basic in the classrooms. We have to, and that's when you start to build a step by a step. Challenge the students, and actually the students sometimes challenge me, of course. And my favorite question, uh, answer is now is, uh, oh, I don't know, I need to check. Because it's true. I, I have two, two comments on, on this. First of all, I think that students never ever bore with questions. The most questions there are, the best it is. When a professor has no time because there is a need to reach the end of the lesson, let's say to follow a certain agenda, if absolutely needed, a trained professor, thanks to APTN experience sharing, uh, <laughs> is, able to, uh, is able to, let's say, shorten the reply or manage to orient the reply. So for students, Students sometimes are shy. They, they believe they don't exist for the professor. It's just the contrary. Uh, they, they exist and exist and exist. The lesson, the class is made for them. So that's why uh, as many questions as there are are always welcome and help us. Those who don't accept questions, to my opinion, cannot really teach because they do not really, uh, they are not open to dialogue in a way and therefore too empowering. That's, that's my personal vision. Uh, the second comment uh, relates to what you have mentioned with the touching the, the, the reality, touching the, the, the real facts. And this is the, the also, that's more sharing an experience. I think that you have to start basic and then you have to, to accelerate. I spent uh, uh, the double of time in my first lessons for concepts that I would teach in another course at the end of the class. For example, in some courses I need to teach patent law, in general courses of IP patent law, uh, basics on patent law. I spend the double of time that I would spend if I teach them in the intermediate or last part of the course. Because the students have to get progressively on board and touch the Kit Kat, touch the reality touch the real things. And this is something that is so important. Actually, pandemics has also changed the game because we all had to reinvent ourselves. And uh, I realized how this was important with the online uh, teaching, making even more applied. What we learned from the onli online teaching will serve massively the, uh, uh, the, teach the teacher's community because we will, at the end, we will uh, uh, we will be better in the classroom. I'm not talking of me personally. We will be better in the classroom because we had to learn how to reach people, how to reach students and make them interacting, 
uh, in an environment which is dry, distance. Yes, Ulrika. Additional question or comment? Yes, Ruben, Hello, Pedro. Thank you very much, my name is Ruben. Um, I I fully agree with you, um, but I was I was uh, talking with Ulrika and, and Joe yesterday about the role of of a university. And I have a quite a romantic um, concept of university and, and the exchange and the role university plays in in, um, in society. And uh, I really believe this is great. But uh, and I, I'm I'm working also in, in the supply chain, no? In the in the um, individual supply chain, they go to university and they define, they they grow and they go somewhere else. Maybe to a company, maybe uh, they remain at university. I'm, I was wondering um, what can universities do to uh, make this, this, yeah, this transition s s uh, more smooth. Um, maybe involving I the industry uh, so that the industry knows what has been, what universities are doing and to know that disabled people are able to, to carry out the, the same task that People that don't don't have that that complex uh, that complexities. Um, my only fear is that all this work we are doing, um, it is am amazing and is very useful, but doesn't have an impact on on real life and on the ability to to be um, independent somehow and economically and and societal uh, independent. Thank you very much. If I understood your question, I apologize. Uh, it's about what can the education do to provide students with the skills needed in real life? Is that correct? And, and, and yeah, and also to, to let know the industry that that people is, is going to market. Um, because we, we may, uh, may carry out a, 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 a splendid work and, and may, uh, yeah, educate people very well. But if the industry and if companies in the general public doesn't know that, <coughs> they won't have the place. Yes. Yes, you are right. Um, at the University of Buckingham, we're working at the moment with something which is called an e-portfolio. 
In the e-portfolio, we are providing students with different type of skills. We, as an institution, as many others around the world, we used to have just one or two types of assessments, which is the written final assessment, the exam, the dreaded exam, and some oral presentations or oral exams. So what we're trying to put together is other type of assessments that are still linked, of course, to the learning outcomes, but provide the students with the soft skills that are needed in the job. Regardless of whether our students are going to be solicitors, barristers, is whatever industry they are going to be on. So that's what we are at the moment, changing the whole curriculum. We started with level four, level five, and this year we are targeting level six. So for example, for me in IEP, I have two assessments. One is an infographic, because that's needed in every industry. They need an infographic, okay? And the second one is that I'm working with a business school. Business school has a model in which uh, the assessment is to build a business. So the group come to my lessons, pitch the business idea, and my students in 72 hours need to write a legal report. That is reality. And that's what we do in the IPR uh, SME help desk. We, they gave us 72 hours to do the guidance and advice. So I'm trying to follow what in the practice is. I have others uh, in the team that are working, for example, to write a letter to an MP because we forget that students are not writing as much as we used to. It's the text language, the WhatsApp language. So they forget what is in capital letters, things like that, you know? Just go into the basics, okay? So we're trying to assess them in different ways in which we get a bonus of the learning that comes out there, but they can use that in the practice. Thank you very much. I think this is the uh, last question we can take, except if there is a very, very short one, because now we have the uh, lunch, which is served just in front of this current room, and we have a connection with the USA uh, uh, with a keynote speaker during the lunch. I warmly, warmly thank uh, the two speakers of the, uh, in presence, plus of course, Soichi, for uh, this session. We learned so much, we learned so much uh, since uh, for a day and a half, and in the last session in particular. So all our warm thanks to all of you.
time. <laughs> oh, don't worry, I'm long past that. <laughs> So we shall perhaps put the video. You, uh, if you want so, Mickey, can you manage to open your, uh, your camera? I, it does not want to open. It says that it's fine and I should be able to share it, but I can't click on the share video. And, uh, the, 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 the problem is not yet the video. The problem is that we don't see you and we dream to see yes, you. I Mm -hmm. Do I need to check share camera or something? Uh, uh, you need to click in the central button of Blackboard. You see that there is an uh, uh, audio and uh, a camera button that you need to yeah. click. Yeah. It won't. It won't do anything. Mm -hmm. Let me let me call the computer specialist so that we try to arrange this. Uh, yeah, I wondered if it was maybe controlled by you all, but... Not really. I think, let's put the situation in control, but I think he will manage. I can share my screen, though. So... See, uh, uh, she, she doesn't manage to share the screen. So. No, I can share my screen. I can't share my sí, pero para ver video. Qué le hacer. Uh, so, can you manage to share it so that the technician who is next to me, Miki, will be able to, um, uh, bueno, mira, to help you? Me, yeah, he's able to help you. Shares, I can share my screen. Yeah, she can uh, puede compartir la pantalla, pero no entiende por qué no puede ser visible. Ah. Vale, sí, la pantalla sí. Sí, pero ¿por qué no se la ve ya? No, pero que si puede dar en configuración, eh, minimizar. ¿Y ¿Usted puede...? Eh, no. ¿Ella no, no puede poner este? Claro, pero esta no es la aplicación. Ajá, ¿Le puede entonces. decir que ponga Blackboard para ver lo que le pasa? Sí. Uh, uh, are you on Blackboard normally? Because no, we pero. could see your presentation. Uh, yes. Yes, but we don't see you. So in order that we see you, you need to click on, on the third of the bottom vale. buttons. Se la voy a enseñar yo aquí, si no. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, apparently the technician is able. Can you see her? Se la voy a enseñar un segundo. A ver, he's trying to fix it. So just please a moment of patience and we will try our best Ish. to support. There. And aquí no sé cómo se llama. Settings, camera. Settings. Y para probar. Ok. Bueno, yes. es este no es el de aquí. Yeah. Yeah. Y aquí puede ver el vídeo. Y ya simplemente eh, sería dar aquí. That's her? Or that's us? Eso más o menos lo que tiene que hacer. So you should open your video which is right in the middle, the button which is here. Mickey. Yes. Could you yes. click on this I, one, I the one with that. the camera? Can you click on it? Uh, when I click on it, it does not allow me to share. It says that my video is fine, and I, but I, there, the, um, the button for sharing is not hot. It's not clickable. No, but first you click on the video one, so we see you, and then you take care of sharing. The important thing is that we see you first. I, I can't do it. Hmm. When I click on the video, the only button that w I'm allowed to click on is cancel. Even though I have ah, a message okay. that says that share when you're ready for others to see you, but that button does not click. We are trying to sort it out from here. Just give us a second, thank you. A ver, tiene que dar aquí, seguramente, y dejar de, y, y dar permisos para compartir. Uh, okay, so, 
uh, now we, we try to identify another formula. In the address bar of um, Blackboard Collaborate, when you see eubbcollab.com, just in the internet address bar, you see that there is a lock. Can you see the lock? No, I'm sorry, I can't figure out where you are on my screen. No, no, oh. no, no, no. Don't um, go, go to the top okay, part. Okay, I see it. Yeah, there is a I lock. I see it. EUBB collab co bar, uh, uh, slash collab okay, UI and so on. So it. there is a lock there, as you can see. Click on the okay, lock. Let me try again. Click on the lock. Click on the lock, there it goes. and then now there you you write reestablish authorizations. You can see it, reestablish authorization, and you you open camera microphones uh, uh, sound, and that would work. Can you click on this one? Can you see me now? So EU BB collab. You click on the lock, and from the lock, you establish connections. Y ahora que vuelva, try to share. Try to share now. That's it. You were there. That's it. You are you are back to uh, with us. Mickey, are you with us? Uh, now, yes. Yes, and we can see you. We can even see you. OK. Technology was half our friend now. So we, we are super happy to welcome you. This is for us a major honor and pleasure. I, I declare this session open, and we um, we invited Miki Kiat, who is the co-director of the IP Management and Markets Program of the Illinois Institute of Technology in the US. She's in particular, uh, being uh, deputy director of the IP program in law from Chicago Kent College of Law. She's in particular in charge of the Center for IP Understanding and its relations. So we will see together today the bridges and not the barricades that uh, the Center for IP Understanding is trying to develop in the US. Um, we are very much fascinated that you can be with us at the very first presentation of this uh, two days conference. A reference was made to how Kent College of Law is paving, uh, was paving already 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, our knowledge on intellectual property in Europe. So we are interested to see parallel developments, and we are much interested to understand from you how you are revamping in the current days, as you explained to me, uh, the Center for Intellectual Property Understanding, and how possible bridges can be made, not only uh, bridges towards our audience, students and society, but also between us. Miki, welcome to the IPTN family, and the floor is yours. Thank you all so much. Um, I, I'm so pleased that, that I'm able to participate in this. I've had such a wonderful time listening to everybody. I've thoroughly enjoyed, learned a lot, and um, I've been stimulated. To, to think more of, about a, a variety of teaching methods. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me start by clarifying that the Center for IP Understanding is a not-for-profit organization in the United States that uh, is a standalone organization and it, at the center has a number of people whose names you probably would recognize on the board. Brian Hinman at Aon, uh, formerly at Philips, Manny Schechter at IBM, Keith Bergelt, who's the CIO of uh, OIN, um, and uh, several others. 
Bruce Berman is the chair, and you probably know of his blogs through IAM Magazine and other places. Um, <clears throat> as part of, as the center of what, the core of what um, we are trying to do at CIPU, we believe in the need for IP literacy. Uh, literacy has become a buzzword in a number of areas, including media literacy, but we believe IP literacy is important at every level. And that um, in order to create this IP literacy, you have to have engagement. And you all have been addressing this brilliantly throughout this uh, conference in a variety of ways. Um, but that is the necessary thing. We have to draw people's attention to what it is we are presenting. And that's not always easy. At the uh, college, the undergraduate and graduate level, it's much easier because we have control over those students to some extent. But for the K through 12, for young people, who want to build business, businesses, who are thinking and creating, it's sometimes much more difficult. So therefore, we have tried to do some things uh, through our website. And those of you who have already tried to get to ipbasics.org, you will find it's not there, which is why with apologies to Patricia, I, I, uh, and almost all words and no pictures on this. A little bit of color, but, but uh, very few pictures. IPBasics.org is our second go round and it is days away from being published. Um, but right now at uh, the Center for Intellectual Property Understanding website, there is a resource page that sort of predicts what we are trying to do. So what I'm going to do is to try to let you know what we have put together. Um, be, one item before I do that is to uh, let everyone know some of the things that I, CIPU does provide. We do have an annual meeting that uh, we have been doing called IPASS, uh, Intellectual Property Awareness Summit. And that's been going on for several years. We're not a very old uh, organization, only about five years old. We also do some reports that are not heavily researched, but they try to gather uh, a consensus read of different things that are going on. And one of those, for example, was how is IP being taught in the top 20 business schools in the US and surprising results from that. IP Basics is of course our, our major online presentation and then um, podcasts that we just recently started as well. Our audiences are inclusive. We are trying to get to everyone. And I put the top two there, creators and inventors, students K through 12 and above mostly because those are the audiences that are sometimes the most difficult to get to um, look at and, and think about IP. Uh, the other three, they need assistance as well, and we want to include them, but they typically start with a little bit more knowledge. And so we begin our thinking from the, with the assumption that there is a low level of knowledge. And so again, we're trying to engage people first, get them to be interested and start thinking of questions in their own mind. Um, and so this is what we have come up with for our new page. Um, and I, these are the uh, options that you have, the tabs at the top. There's the home page, and it begins with what everyone needs to know. But instead of just saying, this is what you need to know, we've done this by pulling out products and giving examples of products and how they have used IP in a variety of ways. And you all are 
so sophisticated that I don't need to go through these uh, in specifics. But Nike, Legos, trademark, um, uh, having things like the Legos playgrounds and stores, uh, Beyonce and uh, the trademark and the uh, products that she has. We all know iPhone or and more generically smartphones. And then we include amoxicillin because we do include something that is uh, now in the public domain and uh, generics can be made from it. And we end that page, as you can tell, it's very brief. We, uh, we really are wanting people to see this and start asking questions. When you go to Nike, for example, there, there's a picture of, the, of Nike shoes and you can hover over it and click on things to see they used this type of IP. They used this type of IP. This is what this is doing or represents. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we end with two videos that are very, very short. Why should I care? And then a basic understanding. The second tab goes into the types of IP, obvious, the regimes, and some principles that include things like theft is something that devalues the IP and is also um, a problem with regard to quality and quality control. We address the impact in terms of the value that IP brings uh, to the economy, to the world, the jobs. These are mostly information sheets that, that bring uh, the statistics that you need in order to to really make the case and this gets more in the depth of ip in terms of the things that you need to know and then we end with some resources that include news and and different topics and there are videos and fact sheets and other things that uh, are included there I'm being brief because I know y'all are behind schedule and I want to help as much as I can. But here is the website that um, will be up probably this week, but I can't guarantee it. And um, the website for the CIPU generally. I, I've enjoyed so much learning things. And for example, I, I loved Carolyn Cole's uh, virtual reality approach to things. It, 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 learning was, it's fascinating. I don't know how we could maybe use something like that, but there's always that possibility. The 4IP Council was really an impressive approach. And part of the things that I've learned is how many things are out there. I do want to make one point about our IP basics. We are trying not to create, we are trying to curate. And so what we have really done is to link to information that is of the ilk I have explained, but that it's something that someone else has done. So we have links to USPTO, WIPO, UKIPO, uh, Mickelson, uh, many, many of the very good sources. And I'm so pleased that I've been able to learn about more sources. And I think that all of these sources are terribly, terribly important because as we've seen, and as Patricia reminded us, people think differently and we need different approaches. And what one group might be doing will be great for people who think in one way or have a certain background. What we are doing might be better for a different group or a different demographic. Um, but I think that what all of us are doing is just so important to get the word out and to make the contact and the connection with those who need this information. Thank you again. I really appreciate being included. And it was good actually to see some friends that I've made over the years and uh, hope that you all have a fine ending to your conference.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Miki, for being with us today and throughout the conference, as you've done. Also for accepting to talk at a time that made you waking up very early, though you were already connected very early to follow us, and we, we really appreciate the honor. So uh, for sure, uh, we, there is a lot of, uh, there are many thoughts from your, uh, many thoughts and thoughts that come from your uh, presentation. I would wish to open the floor to questions. Ulrika, any? So I, th I think we shall further, uh, any additional question in the group? Ulrika wants to raise a question. Professor Wenerstein from the University of Lund. So I, I will, uh, I think this is a great initiative. Thank you so much and thank you for a very good presentation. Uh, just a clarification because we are now have seen the uh, presentation for, for IP. Uh, and I think this could be a really good complement as this is, uh, as I understood, on US law. Uh, IP, this IP basic. Um, if I understand correctly, is this only US law? Uh, and no, it is not. Okay. Uh, we do link to UK IP for some of the educational resources that are provided there that are really fabulous for young children um, and uh, to WIPO for so many of the things that they have available. Uh, and we, we want to link to anything worldwide that we can find. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miki. Are there any additional questions? In which case, we, will, we thank you really warmly for, for being with us, for sharing your experience, for offering the opportunity to uh, sharing and pooling energies, which is really our philosophy. Thank you, th thank you so much, Miki. <laughs> Now, I think there is, uh, we, may, we make a change of session. The session will be chaired by our uh, uh, board member, Professor um, Adoration Perestroya, who will uh, share the session on innovative methods for IP teaching in universities. That will be the last session before the open committee meeting to which you are all invited. And last but not the least, the session is chaired by a pure Madrilin and Spanish colleague. Okay, <clears throat> uh, we arrived to the last session of this wonderful uh, conference. Uh, well, as you know, uh, the IP team uh, has, among other goals, to, to share good practice in teaching and to explore innovative uh, teaching methods. Uh, we have seen uh, during these sessions uh, many presentations in this uh, direction of uh, explaining yes today uh, we have some and yesterday too but now we have the last session uh, indeed focus in pedagogic methods uh, innovative methods for IP teaching well we have three uh, three presentations the first of one uh, will be uh, pedagogic methods used in teaching IP licensing to stimulate collaboration and students' interaction in a post-COVID world. Uh, when we are talking about innovative methods, uh, we, we, we are in front of so many novelties mm, 
One is the pandemic, other as we saw, uh, or as we see, are the new uh, technological tools that we can use. So there are so many, so many uh, things around us that uh, I think this last session will be uh, very important for this conference. Uh, to present this first, this first uh, presentation, uh, we have three uh, professors from Bul Bulgaria. Mm, we had also some years ago one conference of the APT in Bulgaria. Uh, welcome, Migliana Molova, Rumiana uh, Bretznika, and Fanny Koleva. Mm, some of you presented in previous uh, APT meetings. And, and you, are, you have been connected, yes, uh, these days. And, and well, we would like you to be here in person, but, but uh, using the technology, seeing you, uh, and the floor if, is yours. Uh, Migliena, are you speaking uh, in, the, in the first choice? Isn't it, Miliana? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And uh, we are all very sorry for not being able to be with you uh, these days. But hopefully next year we will be all set and uh, manage to join you. Uh, so I will be the, the one to present um, our uh, work and second meet load the presentation so that you can see it. This is uh, a presentation of uh, more or less uh, some accumulated knowledge on um, teaching IP licensing for non-law students. And you will see uh, upgrading this uh, with some collaborative methods and uh, also some additional tools that allowed us to actually um, work in a better way with uh, the students. So the presentation is uploaded and I hope that you can see it now. Yes, we see the slides. Yes, very good. good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, I will first make a brief overview about um, the IP licensing for non law students and what we actually include as methods. Um, we uh, first started with collaborative teaching, with uh, making the modules uh, being taught from different people with different backgrounds and you will see later on why we did that. And then we brought IP licensing from theory to practice using case studies, engaging real licensing policies and practices, and enriching these with project-based learning and peer-assisted learning, also adding psychological profiling of students and, uh, of course, assessment of students' work. And you will see why we actually added these elements in our teaching methods. About licensing, we uh, consider that this is quite a complex topic because students uh, need to first have good understanding of IP protection at first place and then have specific knowledge in law and specific knowledge in economics about prices, value, resources management. Also, we consider it's um, quite a challenging subject to teach because IP licensing can be both industry specific and IP specific. So students need to know how to read and search patent information when it comes to technology licensing, to know how to determine the state of the art in the respective technological fields, and also to have the possibility to recognize the limitations for commercialization of specific technologies regarding the scope of IP rights, 
freedom to operate issues also which may arise in the process of commercialization of the technology. About being IP specific, um, technology licensing will require different prerequisites and considerations from trademark licensing, for example. And you will see in the topics that we teach in this subject that we cover first the introduction to licensing transactions, what they are and what is the specific um, properties of, uh, let's say, this field of knowledge of IP. Then we cover the fundamentals of technology, uh, technology licensing. And we go to um, licensing as technology commercialization strategy and licensing as technology acquisition strategy. So we cover both sides of the process. Then we uh, teach our students about the strategic objectives and risks of technology licensing deals, continuing with fundamentals of trademark and design licensing, and then uh, covering the mechanisms for managing the licensing transactions and the negotiation strategy and structure of the licensing agreement. As I showed you in the beginning, uh, one of the first methods that we uh, used in uh, building this discipline uh, for uh, the four-year students in economics in our, in our university is to uh, work collaboratively. And uh, you can see here that each one of us as co-authors of uh, this paper and the presentation and also uh, being teaching these specific subjects uh, from the topics that it covers. Dr. Rumiana Bresnichka uh, is the person who covers the general topics of licensing and trademarks and designs, also being an EU IP representative and core expert. Uh, myself, I deal mostly with the topics that concern technology licensing, including software licensing and IP searches. And Dr. Koleva covers the legal aspects, including the financial and competition law. Bringing IP licensing from theory to practice, we work with uh, case studies where students are presented with actual licensing policies and practices of national and international companies, individual inventors, IP owners. And uh, we pay here special attention to types of contracts, specific clauses, antitrust considerations connected with licensing too. Also uh, using the, some, also some of the resources that were mentioned uh, today and yesterday, uh, we incorporate in this subject um, project-based learning, engaging the students with real-life challenges. Usually it is a scenario for a licensing deal that focuses on specific problem on the market, requiring more than one market entity to work on it to be solved. And the students are required to work on the task, researching the companies which can participate as licensor and licensee to solve the problem based on their R&D profiles, IP rights portfolios, and so on. And then building the licensing deal with the particular terms and conditions. And going back, uh, going further to the specific tasks that we uh, engage students with, um, we teach students in a group of around 40 students, and they work in groups of four. Uh, the specific tasks that they receive, uh, first of all, uh, engage them with identifying the patents, designs, trademarks in the relevant databases and describe the territories of protection, specifics of ownership of the IP resource, whether it's company owned or by an individual inventor, whether there is co-ownership, how this would influence the licensing deal, term of protection and so on. Then we ask them to identify the parameters of the transaction, subjects, objects, type of rights. Is there a transfer of the object, transfer of any additional resources, terms and territories? And if the case study lacked these specific parameters, uh, the students' teams are asked to indicate in their opinion which could be or should be the appropriate transaction parameters. 
Then we ask them to analyze the specific licensing strategy from the licensors and licensees perspective. And then the licensing strategy is to be analyzed also in terms of market constraints and specificities. They are required to do best analysis and competition analysis. And based on these analysis, the team might justify their opinion on the licensing strategy chosen in the specific case study. Also, they need to analyze the strategic objectives and the risks of the transaction and the mechanisms for managing the licensing transaction. In, and um, since um, licensing is about negotiation and teamwork, because it's really uh, impossible for one person to cover all the aspects of the licensing deal, we encourage them to work together and uh, having in mind that most of the time we work with them remotely due to the pandemic, uh, we encourage them to have um, group discussions, group talks, and um, to work together to solve all these tasks that are given to them. And in order to encourage, let's say, the socialization of different types of people, we also use uh, psychological profiling of the students for the purpose of engaging them in the project-based learning and the case studies which they need to um, work on together. And uh, in order to do that, we use a resource uh, called 16 Personalities, an instrument of the NERIX analytics. Um, in this instrument, people are divided into four categories, and analysts, diplomats, sentinels, and explorers. And we form the students' groups, having one person from each category to be included in the group. And we do that um, because each person has their individual um, characteristics, let's say. and. For example, in order to do a better presentation in front of their colleagues, the team is recommended to use a person of the analyst type, preferably a debater. In order to pull off emotions around negotiating team terms of deals, to use a diplomat. For doing difficult tasks which require attention to detail, to organize others to reach a common goal, sentinels are their best there. And explorers can find um, can help in finding unusual solutions to problems, exploring various viewpoints. Um, when we introduced this instrument, uh, giving them the tasks uh, at the beginning, it was not, um, let's say, um, hard welcome decision because this put them in a situation where we formed the groups. Uh, without giving them the possibility to form the groups themselves. And um, we did that on purpose because when uh, we leave them with the possibility to choose who to work with, they usually do this uh, based on their friendship, uh, based on, uh, let's say, proximity and closeness to each person. Uh, either they are in the same student's house and so on. and. Uh, we wanted to put them in a more real life context where they will be um, more or less um, will be needing to work with uh, different people, even people they don't know, people that they disagree with and so on. And um, at the beginning, as I said, they met this decision uh, not very well and uh, asked us several times to change the process for their preferences, let's say. But uh, at the end of the semester, because this is um, a subject that is taught in their final semester, in their fourth year, they all shared that uh, this gave them the opportunity to know more people, to um, understand in a better way how to lead the negotiations, how to work on a common task. And uh, even if, it's what, if it was difficult in the beginning, it was very helpful giving them the also necessary soft skills in order to uh, work successfully uh, on the market one day. So this is uh, briefly what we do. And uh, I hope that uh, 
it can give you some insights also for your work and I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Migliana. <laughs> Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, do we have here uh, any question about the presentation? Yes, we have one question here yeah. from Olivia. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Indeed, I was very interested in this uh, tool you mentioned for profiling students, according to their psychology. Yes. Uh, um, could you develop a little bit more about the, the system, the, the software you used? For example, uh, in your opinion, what's the idea number of students that should be checked in order to have reliable data? I don't know, is maybe a group of 50 people is too small or is too big? Uh, just a bit your experience in this sense. Yes, uh, yes, thank you for, for the question. Uh, so uh, the tool that uh, we use is a tool that uh, was uh, developed by a um, team of professionals, so um, working in the field of psychology, and they build on uh, the theories of Hofstede and uh, also um, about the uh, profiling that uh, is already known, let's say. However, they add to this the, the possibility uh, for, um, for the person to have the freedom to, to change their views, let's say, and uh, the way they work. So they uh, do this profiling or let's say suggest that this profiling is done um, on a regular basis and they also have um, a tool that can help you directly to build the necessary team for a specific task. So if you want, um, because uh, we use the tool by asking the students doing their personal profiles and then we ask them to share uh, just the types of the profiles without asking them of the answers they have given in the system. So just the profiles, for example, a debater or uh, an analyst, a diplomat and so on. And uh, when they share with us their profiles, we then uh, on a random basis make the groups having one type of person per group. It's in the ideal case, you will have um, one type really for group, but in um, because we had such cases, uh, because it's not always the, let's say, the sample you get with the students, you don't know what kind of people will come in your group. And uh, for example, last year we had half of the groups with uh, more um, diplomats and analysts uh, lacking sentinels and explorers. So we made the groups in such a way that at least to have two or three types of the profiles. And uh, um, we also, uh, when doing this, we explained to them uh, the reason behind it. And uh, as I said in the beginning, some of them shared that, for example, there were people who didn't want to work on the group tasks or people who uh, didn't want to deal with, let's say, uh, difficult tasks that required um, working with detailed information, with patent information and so on. Uh, so we work with them uh, through the process because the project-based uh, learning tasks that they get, they get them in the beginning of the semester. So they have the whole semester to work together, uh, the four uh, people in the group, and to uh, solve all the tasks that you saw here. And uh, when they have some problems and they experience some problems in the groups, uh, usually we advise them that they made the division of tasks not according for the, uh, let's say, uh, the best characteristics of each type that is in the group. So we reorganize them for, um, 
for the sake of the work to go smoothly. But uh, um, if you use the instrument, let's say, for the first time, you also have the possibility, as I said, to uh, ask the instrument do the grouping and the teamwork for you and make the analysis of the team that you already have and then uh, have the division of tasks uh, as for the resources you have, the people you work with. Okay, uh, I think you have finished, yeah, Migliana? Thank, yes, thank, th you. thank yes. you. It was very, I think, yes, good explanation. Uh, thank you, Migliana. Uh, thank you uh, also to Fanny Koleva. Uh, thank you both uh, for this presentation. Mm. Thank you very much for thank having you. us. Now we are going to the second uh, presentation of this session uh, that will be Oh, sorry. Yes, another. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's go to the second presentation of this, this session. Uh, it will be uh, in charge Maurizio uh, Krupi. Uh, Maurizio, uh, he is at the present working in the Court of Justice of Luxembourg. As a student of IP, he has experienced uh, different teaching methodologies in different countries, Spain, Italy. Mm. Uh, he is also linked to the University of Alicante and the Maastricht uh, University. And he's going to, to tell us about blended methodology, a solution or a new problem. Uh, Mauricio, I don't know if you want to sit um, here to... I can yeah. sit here, it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank Adjust. you very much, Mauricio. Sí. Thank you very much, Professor, for your uh, kind introduction and good morning, everyone. Uh, before uh, starting, just a little disclaimer. I'm sorry if maybe the slides are a bit too wordy, but for next presentation, I'll do my best to, to shorten a bit. Um, well, the idea for this presentation came from my uh, teaching experience and how this has been affected by the uh, pandemic. Um, in particular, starting from last academic year, um, after a full lockdown and online teaching, many universities reopened their door to students in a kind of blended modality, so online and in-person teaching activities. Um, the, pro the problem, I would say, is that uh, new variants of the virus and the necessity to keep, in any case, the social distancing among students obliged to keep these models until maybe the end of the uh, sanitary crisis that we all hope is going to end soon, but what, what's next at the end? Is there a lesson to be learned for the future or not? Can we use some of these tools we are all experienced now also for new situations and to solve new problems we might face um, in, in the coming months? Who knows? Um, so the aim of this presentation is indeed to give a little overview, some definitions of what's blended learning or blended teaching, as I call in this presentation, just to stress, to give an emphasis to the role of teacher in the equation, plus some pros and cons um, and a feedback from my, from my experience. Of course, feel free to jump in anytime. I'm very much looking forward also for your experience and to see if it's the same that mine or you have different views in this matter. Coming to definition, well, uh, the notion of the expression blend, blend, blended learning 
is indeed the most common you can find on the web. Apart from that, you have also hybrid learning, technology-mediated instruction, and many more. But what is clear is that the core of this definition, there are two components here, an online and physical teaching. The um, most often cited uh, definitions date from 2006 and 2004 can be found here. And they define blended learning as a kind of combination of face-to-face -face instruction with computer-mediated instruction, or a second one that I personally prefer, is a kind of thoughtful integration of classroom face-to-face -face with online learning experiences. The second one, I think, is a bit more qualitative-driven, plus it opens up a bit, not just instruction, but it's a bit wider learning experiences, which I found a bit more comprehensive. As I said, there are different models. There are different blended teaching models, uh, which, I mean, the difference is mainly the ratio of online and physical uh, teaching experience we have here. From the face-to-face -face driver, which is the one where there's just a professor sitting in front of a classroom and delivers the content in a very traditional way, plus it gives some uh, extra homework for students to be done at home online, or maybe just a certificate to achieve at home in order to have an extra point the day of the, of the exam. Then we have a rotation model that is one used, for example, by Maastricht University, uh, where students are divided into two groups, kind of 50-50%. Uh, some students go to class and have a kind of traditional teaching experience, while the others stay at home and assist via um, webcam or they just have uh, the, le the lecture recorded and can have access to it all the time when they want. And then they simply switch after maybe one or two weeks. And so the second group comes to class while the other stays at home. The self-blend model, um, here uh, the, I mean, the power is given to students, so it's up to them to come to class or to follow the content uh, autonomously at home through online platforms. And when it comes to Flex and online driver, here the difference is mainly um, how much teaching is performed in class. In, in the online driver model, the totality of teaching happens online, and students rely to the professor or the teacher only when they have doubts. So they come to the university and they ask some specific doubts or they want to review their exam, for example. But uh, what's in common in all these models? Well, um, there are, I would say, three pillars. The first one is the learning environment. That is how and when the teaching takes place that can be synchronous or an asynchronous model. That means simply that uh, the teacher is sitting in front of students and is delivering content in the same place and at the same time for everyone. Or maybe simply is recorded so students can have access to the content wherever, but also whenever they want. Media is the second pillar and is simply the um, tool by which the content is provided to students. Maybe um, physical paper or electronic paper, CD-ROM, if anyone is still using them, who knows, but our instructional pillar that is uh, a bit the goal of this, of this teaching. So what kind of quality objectives we want to achieve? That, of course, depends in, in each case. If we want to give some practical experience to students, I'm thinking of laboratories. So, of course, we have to choose a specific model and prefer a model to another one. Um, pros and cons of all models. Of course, it depends. It depends on the number of students we have in front of us, or what, what kind of students. Are there bachelor students, master students, uh, PhD students? Of course, there's a lot of difference there. Mm, these pros and cons come a bit from my experience, but also a literature review that I made. So uh, feel free to add something if you, if you want. Uh, what I found is that 
these uh, blended learning models facilitate somehow uh, some simultaneous and independent and or collaborative learning. So the idea is that students, uh, by learning, let's say, also with uh, online or some uh, online tools, are more independent and they dig more and they look for the information they want on the web. Or create a kind of collaborative structure in the sense that um, they create maybe a chat or a blog and they tend to find solutions to problems by themselves. Um, another point is that this kind of uh, model, this educational model, is cheaper than the traditional one. Students don't have to move to come to class. And in some circumstances, of course, also universities don't need so many big rooms and big spaces. Of course, I don't think universities are going to change just for two years of pandemic, but maybe new models might uh, appear of online universities uh, as we already have. And what I found personally really interesting is the higher accountability of uh, student logins and uh, work they did. So if you want to take into account the active participation in class and you have a huge number of students, 100 students or more, this system is indeed very helpful because it allows you to keep track of the activity of students. And of course, gives more freedom to students. They, have, they are more autonomous, I would say. They can have access to content whatever, when, whenever and whatever they want. But on the other side, there are also some problems, some disadvantages, I would say. So there's a lot of uh, dependence on technical resources. Um, Please, I, I had so many problems with Wi-Fi connections. I hope, I, hope, I mean, I, I expect you had the same problems. I'm not the only one. Um, and not only technical issues, but simply talking from home and presenting some results of the end of my PhD research at the final conference, and all of a sudden your neighbor starts drilling and renovate his apartment. And, uh, never happened to me, of course, but uh, um, also, I, I experienced that very few students watch the videos or read the materials on time or on a regular basis. They tend to accumulate everything and then they uh, read it at the very last moment. And so this is a problem regarding our quality objectives because we want students to pass the exam brilliantly. And also this is very personal. Maybe it's just me that I'm not very uh, an IT guy, but. Uh, I think providing feedback online is a bit more time consuming than doing that in person. Not just because you have to have an exchange of emails with a student, maybe create a Zoom link, but also have the feeling that sometime having the person in front of you and just making, I don't know, a little scratch on paper is way more effective when you are in person rather than doing it through a webcam. Coming to, to my experience, I compared the, the results, at least my feelings, my feedback, of um, a lecture I gave on GIs, on geographical indications and product specifications, which is the topic of my PhD thesis, uh, to a group of LLM students, IP students, in three different years. So in 2019, that was a traditional classroom, people were there in person. In 2020, it was fully online due to the full lockdown. And then in 2021, it was a kind of blended model. So I was there in class, and some students were connected from home. Uh, I mean, without entering too much in details and just looking at the numbers, it was clear that uh, the 2020 and 2021 were like the best years. We had the best results because I was able to reach the entire classroom. So no one was left behind, apparently while the people in 2019 that were not there just had access to my PowerPoint, and that was it. A worthy PowerPoint. Uh, feedback. So um, this seems, I mean, very, very good, very, very useful, but, but the problem is, is uh, um, that I experienced, that I noticed, is that it's way easier to interact with people that are in the same environment where you are. So for me, it was way easier to talk to people that were there in front of me rather than connect with people that were listening to me from home. And that's a real problem because at the end, the students that were absent in 2019, 
because we're not in my classroom, were absent also in 2021. So those were, were not there in front of me, they lost a lot of content. Uh, their camera was off, there was no participation, so I had the feeling that they were not there, absolutely. My point was, since that was a um, small group, we're talking of less than 30 students, is how to fix this bug, this issue. Possible solutions. I think that it's necessary to put people in the same environment. In this case, the only possible one is a virtual environment. And provide digital content as much as possible in order to engage the two group within the same virtual environment. Record possibly the lecture in order to make it available in case some, somebody maybe had a Wi-Fi connection problem or whatever. From the student side, it's important that they bring their laptop and they connect, even if they are in class, but simply because this allows them to talk and connect with people that are at home. I mean, here we are in an amazing setting. We have IT people for us. We have cameras that can record every single angle of the room, but in a normal classroom, we have just maybe one camera facing to me, and that's all. Plus, in some situations, we are not allowed to share the mic for social distancing. So. Uh, people that ask a question in the classroom is not heard by people that are at home, so I have to repeat it, making everything tedious, absolutely. Even more if we are talking of communicative people, master students that want to interact. How to do that? I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, I would say. How to create a virtual room or a virtual classroom? We already have the tools. Google Meet, Zoom, Blackboard, Collaborate, whatever. We all know th these tools. Just use them at the fullest of their potential. Like, how many times it happened that I asked a question in the classroom and they replied with a yes or no, and then I had 30 yes or no in the chat, simply polluting the chat. If there's a polling there, just use it. It makes everything way tighter, more organized, easier to get, also maybe funnier. And what if the ratio of people that are home and online does not allow to create this virtual room. So does it make sense that 80 people are connected with their laptop in class because there's just one that is staying at home? Yeah, maybe not, maybe this is a bit too much. So we can use alternative tools like Kahoot. I don't know if you are familiar with that. It's just um, a software. You create your question there. You put multiple choice answers. And then you have a kind of pin code. So you put the pin code you give the pin code to students, they go online via their smartphone or their uh, computer, whatever, and then they have, it's a kind of quiz game. So they, they go and they answer to the questions. Usually students react very positively to these to this kind of games. So um, kind of conclusions to conclude. The problem is that different learning environments tend to segregate students into groups, and there's a communication problem from the teacher perspective to communicate with a group of students that is not there, it's not in person or online, and also for students to communicate among themselves. A unique, in this case, the only option is a virtual environment, has some benefits because can enhance the discussion among students and also um, give a more kind of more transparent, I would say, evaluation of their participation. Plus, in case we are inviting guests that uh, cannot come in person because they are very far away, they live very far away, or because uh, they don't have time and it's absolutely impossible to, to, to have them in person. So why not to use the system? Because I think for um, a lecturers, it's way better to have in the screen 30 faces with names possibly the cameras on, rather than the view on a classroom with full of, of anonymous people that cannot communicate with the person, with a guest lecturer. Well, I think that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mauricio. It was, I think, very, very interesting. And sure, we have uh, many questions uh, for you. Please. I think.
Hi. So we, we play in that, that game, um, and they have a lot of fun, I can confirm, because um, not only you click the, the, um, the options, you have all the time the rate, raking, and they change, so they get very competitive, uh, and they can put their name or a nickname. So those who are shy can, so I, I really, really recommend it, it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I was thinking about, because I had similar uh, challenges in, in the lectures I, I gave, um, and it, for me it's interesting because I can see the different universities uh, systems. And one of the things uh, we, we saw is that those classes where they asked the students to, to put the camera on were much more engaged. However, this, this depends also on the IT systems. And I'm not an IT person, but I, I wonder um, I have the feeling that, and we saw it today with one of the speakers, that the, you know, this frozen thing, and so if we want to provide this, uh, and I say in plural, <laughs> not in, in this, but I think then we need to make sure the students have the possibility to have the internet connections for, for that, and maybe kind of financial support for those who can do this upgrade which is necessary, because I think the engagement is so much better when when they can see people. I fully agree with you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your for your question, for your comment. I think that if when students are physically present, the problem of the Wi Fi connection is somehow of course they can connect with Wi Fi of the university, but um, when I ask students to put their camera on, of course everyone is tremendously shy and they don't want to do that. Uh, some people say they have issues with the camera. Maybe they have an old laptop, so they... Uh, so of course it's just a way of making the class engaging. And with the master students it was way easier because there were a group of 30 people together for one year. So they were kind of a group of friends, I would say. So they were not so shy. So it was way, way easier than a, a normal undergrad class of 108 people of different background, different experience that they don't know each other very well and they're way more reluctant to talk and speak. That, that's a bit my experience. Back to me. Um, I have a, a, a concern. It's, it's a comment but it's a concern. Because my experience in, in all classes, um, I have participated in all lessons, and um, is that there is a lack of uh, communication from students. Uh, and there is a lack of um, soft skills in, in people that is, are going out from universities. And I wonder whether this type of, type of tools are, are, are helping or not to develop that that type, that type of, of, of uh, factors. So if we are already in a system where students or uh, yeah, uh, alumni go out and don't know how to communicate or how to interact with others in an effective way, I don't know whether this is the, uh, the appropriate solution. I think, I personally believe that this is amazing when there is no other choice. Uh, this is a, a great when you have a, a, a professor from the, the U.S. And, and you have to, to bring him uh, to, to the students somehow. But from that, that perspective, I was uh, the other day uh, speaking in a conference and, and I was, there was a concern that people don't know how to communicate. And I, think, I really think this is not the, um, the right approach if we, have, we want to, to solve this problem. I don't know what's your, what are your views on, on this. Uh, I agree with you 100%. Um, the best solution is to be all together in the same place, uh, I would say. That's by far the best option, the best solution. Sometimes this is not possible because maybe, um, I don't know, I'm thinking of some executive masters where students uh, work and maybe travel a lot. So it's not feasible to put them together in the same class at the same time. So it's good to give some flexibility in the sense, okay, uh, you have a requirement of attendance of 80%. What about the other 20? 
I'm losing that content or there's a way I can have it? Oh, you have the PowerPoint. Yes, sir, but it's not the same. So why don't you record the class and make it available for one, two days? It doesn't have to be available there on the cloud for one year. Also because if it's available for too long, people simply don't watch it until the very end. So I completely agree in the sense with you. Uh, my concern was also making the, uh, the environment more interesting for people talking from uh, very far away. So if there is a US professor, I think it's way easier and nicer to have all the faces and names. And if there is a question from uh, the, the public to, to know who is asking the questions, or use the chat so the person can read. But I agree with you. It's af absolutely the best. Can I just make a <laughs> little remark? I'm sorry, I don't want to manipulate this. But I think I, I disagree a bit. Um, the reason why is that I feel that we miss so much by mixing them that I, I do agree it has to be really super, super necessary because the flexibility that you're bringing with these extra people that you have, you lose it in, in effectiveness. And so, you, for example, I cannot longer walk, which I really love to do <laughs> in my lectures. Um, I, I, people are less spontaneous because then you have to run and change, give the, the microphone. So, yes, there might be some constellations, but that should be definitely the, the big, big, big exceptions. Ye yes, again, uh, I completely agree also. I'm thinking of um, what about students that they cannot travel or have visa issues, for example. So some real reasons by which they cannot come or maybe uh, they come from very far away and they are traveling home for Christmas and simply they want to take this extra week off. So giving flexibility. I think these tools are good for that because give flexibility in some circumstances. Uh, thinking that we can give online masters very easily and have the same results. Well, this might be the case, maybe, but depends also on the degree of experience of the people we are talking to. So if there are maybe young students, it's also extremely important for them to connect. That's a bit maybe the comment also the point that Ruben wanted to, to, to make. I don't know if we have ah, another question, Sorry. Patricia. Um, I, I, I have never used this platform. There is some, something similar in the UK and United States that we use, which is called a Slido. And the students will vote for the higher probability. I think it's quite similar. And, and you have a question about whether this will actually deteriorate students communicating. And actually, I have found out that students communicate more because when we finish the question, you will have the percentage of the students that have answered correctly and those that have said. So what I, is allowing me is to see how a students approach the question and also the knowledge. It could be that 50% of the students got it wrong. So it wasn't just about the students, it was me who was teaching the topic. So I revisit that particular topic and I asked them directly, why do you think that this, this was the best option? So I think that actually this is giving me more opportunities to understand whether the learning that comes and the topics were understood by my students and for them a way to communicate, hey, I don't have a clue of what you just explained to me. I don't know if it's the same, kind of the same platform. Uh, I would say the idea is the same. At the end of the day, the feeling you have is a kind of one wants to be a billionaire. No, a millionaire, yeah, sorry, yeah. I'm talking. <laughs> it is a kind of feeling is the same. Uh, it's extremely useful because you have the results and you can comment with students. If there's a relatively small group, I mean, I would say 30 students, it was excellent because it's engaging them a lot. If it's a very big group, that's excellent to assess if the class is going on the right track or not. And if you have a lot of people that fail the test, why? Because I didn't explain properly because they didn't study. So you, you can already map the situation very well. And I think it's a very uh, funny, easy, and powerful tool at the same time. Okay. So if we don't have any more questions for Mauricio, 
I, I, there is, there is, I, so, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned collaborative learning. So may I ask if you have um, an approach, an experience, and if you believe that dialogue, dialogue P2P experiences are interesting and how to improve in environment of technology. Thank you. S sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. I think, I think with the mask, maybe oh, yes. it's too difficult. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I Yeah, I, I think that you mentioned about uh, collaborative learning in an environment with more uh, technology and uh, more devices, more possibilities, but also distancing, etc. Um, I, I wonder if you have um, thought in, in depth in, in, in the question of how people learn P2P, so in collaborative way, dialogue, dialoguing, and if, just in case technology may improve or not, this kind of human, human um, way of learning. Thank you. Um, I don't have a huge experience on that. I was just uh, noticing how students interact in the chat function of the class. Uh, to see um, sometimes students make a question and, and a colleague is trying to reply to this question. So in the sense it's extremely helpful instead of me answering to the question to ask the student that express a kind of interest to just uh, switch the camera on and take the floor for one minute or two and formulate a bit more what he wants to say. And th th that's my, my experience is not something that happens like all the time, but depending on the degree of experience of students and the professional background, it might happen quite uh, on a quite regular basis. I'm thinking of IP masters, there are maybe students with former IP experience on trademarks or so, and they tend to step up also because they want to take the floor a bit. And this, uh, that's very interesting. To, to share experience also for me an occasion to learn something more. Thank you very much. Uh, do, we ha do we have another question? Not this time. So, so a big applause for Maurizio. I think it was really interesting. Thank you very much. So according uh, with our pro program, there is uh, a last presentation uh, about Maria Markova, but I think we have a technical problem or Maria, I don't see Maria Markova connected. No, nothing in the chat. Yes. She has returned, got the link, and got everything. So perhaps she has blacked out or something. Markova, Maria Markova. I, I emailed uh, her again. And, uh, she there is absolutely nothing. No, no, so I, I, we ask also Fanny and Migliena, because oh. Maria is from Bulgaria, maybe. If they, no, she is not connecting, maybe something happened. So, I don't know, Loren. We, we, we have to skip the last speaker. The last speaker yes. was informed about the session. Mm. Uh, she's the uh, vice rector of uh, the university. Uh, of the Bulgaria, and normally she always replies very well and fast to emails, so I don't know what is happening, but the colleagues do not know as well. So perhaps she has a problem of connection. Mm, okay. I propose mm. at this stage, uh, I don't know, that perhaps we, we pray, if miraculously we have still, uh, uh, if miraculously she comes back while we are doing the meeting, and if you accept so, 
we will take her back for her presentation. But I think that's the only solution we can do. Okay, yes, I think. You all agree with, uh, with me? Uh, hmm. Okay. So we, we move to the, to the committee meeting. I propose we do a five minutes break and make an applause to our se uh, session. So and so we start again in five minutes' time okay. so that you have the time to uh, rest for a second. No, but it was it a funny. No, it's a new one, I think. Which, uh, which is public, so those ah, okay. I don't know. Okay. Mm. Thank you so much. Mm. No, thank you so much to you. Very interesting. Mm. I think we are in transition. No? No. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I, mm. I, I noticed that, that sometimes mm. I was also invited to, to speak mm. when I speak to a group. Yes, and so it's not the I same with faces. Yes. But it's not the same with 50, yeah, sure. like sure. one family, sure. yeah. 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 another yeah. sure. No, absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, again, it depends. Yeah. Yeah. The point is that sometimes students, when there are massive students, yeah. even if it's a big group, yeah. they tend to type notes. No, es siempre escriben algo al ordenador. Por eso digo que como que siempre ya lo tienen ahí, que pongan las mitades también. Yo creo que a los estudiantes en general a la media les gusta dejen confortable los estudiantes. Yo creo que no es confortable for the teacher, ¿no? A los profesores. A ver, es que depende porque algunos tienen un poco esa sensación de estar grabados. Sí. Si te digo algo malo, y si no fijo correctamente mi compañero, ay, ¿qué me pasa? Es que nadie lo va a notar. En casa de, bueno, solo los estudiantes, así se queda en un círculo muy pequeño. Y eso me parece bien. Luego, a los estudiantes lo que le aburre es poner la cámara, es un montón. Porque sí, sí. se sienten un poco pegados. Sí. Están en su cama, sí.
I shall also open the microphone so those who are connected and are part of the IPTN can follow us. Adoration? You are in the center? You are in Madrid, so you are in the center. You are the coordinator. The box. We have. Okay. So, at this very, very stage, this is the very uh, last part of uh, our meeting, uh, and we would wish to uh, discuss very classical issues that we are discussing, the developments in the work of the EIPTN working groups, the way forward for EIPTN, and the session moderators are the three of us. Okay. So perhaps I would wish to come to the topic of the working groups. Um, on our websites, you are seeing the work of our working groups that were presented this morning for the most active ones by uh, uh, Professor Ulrika Wenerstein. So this morning, we discussed IP and fundamental rights. IP in relation to arts, fashion, culture, and creative industries. Uh, none of the other members of working groups have expressed desire to share, uh, uh, to share uh, outputs from what they have done. So I know that uh, uh, some of them are preparing. So uh, of course, the IP and international economic law uh, is preparing for developments, but it was the, the last one that was created. IP strategy and ethics gave no feedback. IP and science, uh, uh, unfortunately, gave no feedback to date. Uh, IP and technology gave once a feedback, and IP for business and entrepreneurship uh, never gave feedback as well. So uh, this is quite worrisome, and this is an issue on which I would wish to uh, consult all of you. Perhaps we should write to all committee members who are in the working groups asking that they produce outputs, otherwise there is no need of working groups. I propose, I submit this proposal. Uh, we need working groups that are working groups. <laughs> So, uh, if you agree, I shall send on behalf of uh, uh, the, the committee a uh, uh, request that they uh, give us uh, updates on their works so that we can include them on our website and at works, if not on works, on projects. Uh, we, uh, we saw that there is a large interest in the topic of publications and booklets, and uh, perhaps some of those who are present today uh, may be interested in mentioning uh, ideas of booklets. We have heard an idea of booklet on IP and standards that could possibly enter into a new working group that could be created. Uh, but there may be also other uh, ideas. Hernan? Yes. So. As, as there is a network with a lot of nationalities, do you think that there is maybe a good idea to have a group about teaching IP and comparative law? Uh, that could be so, Hernan, but uh, after all, yeah, it depends very much on countries and universities. We, for example, at Bocconi are, are doing exclusively this. Uh, at Carlos III, you do it a lot. Yeah, uh, teaching IP, m m my feeling would be, and then we consult the whole committee uh, and the whole present, it could be good that it be uh, teaching, teaching IP in comparative uh, or a comparative, uh, comparative approaches, comparative low approaches in IP teaching. Yeah. Would this suit? Yeah. 
Comparative approaches in IP teaching. Would we all agree that this is a beautiful topic uh, for uh, creating a working group? I, th mm, I think it's, it, it's interesting and we have seen in this conference uh, the different approaches, the United States, uh, countries from Latin America, and the contrast with the approaches in Europe. So I think it's in, in the focus of the network. In my opinion, it's, it would, could be a good group. If we, need, if we have also people interested in working in this group, mm, apart from uh, Hernan. I think also it's a very good idea. So um, I agree. I am totally supportive to it, 1,000%. And I would love to be also in the working group. So who else may want to comment? Gabriele? Uh, in, in order to, to the comment of uh, Hernan, uh, could be possible the concrete in, in, a, in a specific matter, for example, uh, the comparative law in, uh, uh, street, in, in street arts, for example? This could be an interesting approach, but perhaps when the group is in, in itself formed, formed they could decide on topics that they would handle in coordination with the committee. We have always done it this way. So the, the groups propose to the committee their agenda, and from there, we, we see if there are overlaps, we could make two groups working together. And otherwise, uh, we, I think it, this would be a very beautiful idea, yes. So uh, uh, we would create the group on comparative approaches in IP teaching. And then, as you have mentioned, uh, and if you want to be a member of it, we would be super, super happy. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we create a group uh, uh, for working, uh, uh, because we want to have working groups very active. So we, uh, we include also our colleague. So I include David also in the group. Do you agree, David, to be in the group? <laughs> OK. So David, is, David is teaching at the, um, at the Carlos Tercero uh, Master in, uh, in IP. So it's really, really beautiful that you are uh, in, the, uh, in the group. So I have Hernan. David? May I? Yes? So I had two comments. Um, so the first one was again uh, sort of an appeal to join the group on IP traded investment. Um, <laughs> just an appeal because uh, it's small and we would like to uh, make it bigger. But I have a, a comment and that I um, put to the, uh, to the committee members and that came out during the uh, conversation with the senior students um, of, the, of the master. Um, I don't know if it may be interesting, so I just put it, and then, of course, um, you decide according to what you deem more appropriate. Um, I think that it may be interesting, although the network is only for teachers, so people that are teaching, to involve in some way uh, senior students or students, because we were talking about that before, about uh, what if, of course, the kind of input that they can bring, and I think it may be very important, for example, when we are elaborating all these materials on teaching, to have this kind of perspective from the other side of the fence, and, um, and that's it, because I think always that it's good to have this kind of exchange also at our conferences. So I wanted just to put it to the committee as we were talking during the uh, productive coffee break, and, uh, Excellent. Thank you, Gabrielle. I think first, we, we, if we can advance on it, we should uh, first establish a list of the members of the group on comparative approaches in IP teaching, uh, so that we, uh, we, 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 because then when, you are, when we are here, we, we all have the positive energies. When everybody is home, uh, it's harder. I have to send emails, and uh, it takes more time. So. 
so uh, uh, any other volunteer to join the group that Hernan has proposed to create? Comparative law. So for the time being, Hernan, David. Okay. And then I shall, when I shall announce it to uh, all our membership, we will see who wants to join. Okay. Now, uh, an appeal for Gabriel's group, for uh, uh, the one uh, chaired by him on IPN and international economic law. Okay, these are also my topics. Uh, as chair, I don't want to be in too many groups, but uh, okay, I am in the ones of Ulrika. I can be in yours. Okay, fine. So I joined the international economic law. So your appeal is received. <laughs> okay. <laughs> economic law. I try to increase the size of the group and make them productive. This is the mandate the committee gave us. <laughs> okay. Yes? Yes, please. Okay. Axel? Uh, I have a comment. Just earlier you said that there was a suggestion to do IP and standards. Yeah. And then I was trying to figure out where it could fit. So I checked the UN website and the definition of creative industries includes mm -hmm. advertisement, architecture, art and craft, design, fashion, film, video, photography, research and development, software, computer games, electronic publishing, TV and radio. So actually, IP and standards could fit into teaching IP in relation to art, fashion, culture, and creative industries. If Ulrika deems it to be good. Uh, by definition, it could fit. Okay, so avoiding to create a, a group ad hoc, but inserting it there. Uh, how would you feel about it, adoration? I would personally support very much the proposal. Perhaps, we, uh, be, if I may uh, uh, make a suggestion as I made for uh, Hernan, we could uh, put creative slash digital industries which will be clearer for our audience. No? What yeah, do you think? yeah, it's fine. Mm? So we change the title yeah. and make it IP in relation to art, fashion, culture, creative, and digital. Because Axel is right, legally speaking, but it will be more transparent, perhaps, for those who are not so UN-oriented. <laughs> May I, may I, before uh, Professor Gagliani's uh, proposal, uh, if anyone wants to be in any of the groups, please just tell us, because as, as uh, Professor Manu said, I think it's easier if you are here now and then we just put you on, 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 on the web. Um, so if you want to join any of the groups, uh, just, just come forward with the... And then we take uh, Professor Gagliani's uh, suggestion. May I mm -hmm. comment it? Yes, yes. No. Um, for me, uh, in my university, it would be, uh, um, I mean, the total normal thing for us in every group we have, we have students uh, representing. Uh, so in every board meetings, every meetings, there's always students. Uh, I also think that when it comes to teaching, um, as I said, we are, I, uh, my, my, uh, in my view, we are more the facilitators uh, to help you come to, to the, uh, the, the goal you want to. So um, um, for me, it would be, uh, I, I think, it a great proposal. Yes. I agree uh, with the proposal. Uh, I think teaching, uh, uh, we have the two phases, yeah, teachers and students. So, and moreover, the, who are the students now uh, probably will be the teachers tomorrow. So I think it's very important if we have them involved in this network. So I support 100% the idea. If I may, so do I. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea could be that student volunteers, we, we could, I, I, I make a, a complementary proposal to this. 
we prop which is also a way to keep close to uh, the future the students who made us the honor to support the conference, the current conference. Okay. Mm. So we could say that rather than opening it to students, mm. who, which is quite difficult because where are the students coming from, we would decide that as of now, students from the uh, conference, who have attended the conference, can participate to the working groups if they want so. And then, so they can participate this year. Next year, suppose we make our uh, conference in Tahiti. Uh, the, those from the University of Tahiti will be able to uh, 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 participate, let's say, fundamentally. So as such, the idea would be that it is open to the students uh, of uh, the university that hosts us. And uh, we must admit that in the committee, we didn't discuss the Tahiti issue because the university has no IP uh, <laughs> department. So uh, I just took it by chance for the pleasure of all of us traveling to Polynesia, uh, to French Polynesia. Okay. So as such, uh, uh, um, the idea would be to open it to the students. Uh, so there is a kind of window, the students of the conference so in this case, the eight students who were present this time, four plus uh, four, uh, could, can join the working groups, and we would do the same thing as of now at each conference. Is this a good idea? Hmm. Okay, so students participating of the current year. And this is also a way to pay tribute to the students of Carlos III who have been... <laughs> who have supported us and who have been with us throughout. And also a way to recognize their involvement. So make your choices in the working group and let us know. Now or later via email, okay? So look well at the list of the various working groups, and from there, uh, uh, you form part of our family, and this is uh, exactly what we want. Okay. So a, a closed mem an open membership to students, but a closed membership to those who involved in our work. Okay. So I uh, uh, put it for our records. Two, two questions. Yes. Yolanda? Thank you very much, Charles, for that. And I had another idea. Maybe you find it too basic, but since um, we have teachers from many countries in the world, um, and in order to increase the uh, interest of students in the association and in the web, have you ever considered do, doing these booklets, one page or two pages, just uh, reporting the main features of IT regulation in one country, in, in Italy, in Spain, in the Netherlands, in the States. Um, something very basic, it's not, just, it's not a comparative law uh, handbook. Mm, just giving ideas of um, the main differences, because in the end, uh, even between EU countries, there are differences. And um, Latin American countries will add to the booklet with one page, two pages, something very simple. Ulrika? I think it, it on and off. Uh, I think it's uh, um, a, a great idea and uh, I also think that it would be very convenient in, in, in our work um, because sometimes you, you actually put in a lot of effort to find, I mean, the right link to the right legislation and, and it, it takes a lot of time. So if it would be very short and short, very short description, but also with, with links so you can actually easily access and find information, that would be great. I think it's a good idea. 
Yes, I think also it's a very good idea. Uh, we have to to organize us uh, in the way to to get it because also I have to say that uh, our experience is that uh, in the past we have proposed also things to do, but later we all we have <laughs> too many work. Yes, but I support the idea. Mm. Hmm. I, I, I think uh, uh, I like very much the idea, uh, and we could entrust the group uh, of comparative law also to work on this, okay. possibly, bearing in, in consideration the existence of the um, WIPO website, which has one page on each country, but without contents on it. So it could be something very interesting for the, the uh, group on comparative law. And also it depends then, so that's why it's better to leave the group on comparative law decide. Now, now I talk not much as in any IPTN capacity, but mostly as a colleague uh, brainstorming. I think there the issue is which depths, because for example, if we consider IP li uh, patent li licensing or compulsory licenses, the EPO has issued a book which is as big as, as that on the 38 legislation of the 38 e EPO member states. So to which depths do we go? On which topic? Which fundamentals? Where is the start? Where is the end? Because it can be just a gorgeous job, an enormous one, a simple one. That, that could be very good, but if you all agree, we could entrust the group on comparative law to work on this. And uh, Yolanda, do you want, as EIPTN member, do you want to join the group on comparative law? We'll join the arts group instead. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> <Just so. laughs> okay, so I should add Yolanda in the art group. Okay, bye. I'm happy now. <laughs> No. Indeed, as you have seen, we have been developing one booklet, and for now it's just the three of us, Professor Vanessa, Magali, and me. So it doesn't mean that you are obliged to work on the project. If you don't feel comfortable with the project, you don't like something. You can be a member of the group, follow the activities that you reach and that you wish. So I think it was important just to do yeah. that for the other people to know that it's not a commitment like 100%, 24-7. And in particular, uh, we, we didn't talk about it this morning, but some members of the uh, groups uh, that have worked said, oh, uh, I am interested in another project on which there, were, there was not enough members interested, there were not enough members interested, so we never, they never took off. Yeah. So we have in the drawer one or two other projects in the groups led by Ulrika that have not taken off because there were only one or two members who wanted to do it, so he didn't. So, uh, so being in a working group doesn't mean uh, a commitment to spend all Sundays on the projects. So feel free to join. And yes, it's interesting that the working group work, but not everybody has to work uh, in a too active way. It depends very much. Thanks, Patricia. Patricia? Thank you. I have three questions. Three. That I will forget. <laughs> okay, yes, I, I got three. Just take, please remember. Take, take note. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm ready. <laughs> um, my first question before everybody was giving ideas was, I'm too busy. I'm not going to put my hand up for anything. So that's my first question. When I read titles, teaching IP in relation to, what are you expecting so that we feel comfortable to say, I may participate. I can, I can just talk from, from my uh, working groups. I don't uh, expect anything, actually. <laughs> 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 I, I, I think more like if you want to join the project and if you have time, 
that, that's lovely. And if you just want to sit in and listen, uh, when we have, uh, we have online Zoom sessions uh, and small talks and so on, that's fine. If you want to participate one time out of ten, that's fine. If you want to really work, that's fine. This is really the idea. The only thing is that it should be connected. What we are doing is connected to teaching. Yeah. So uh, uh, now what we, the idea currently was to do publications for those of Ulrika that uh, already produced and produced things. Uh, a group may decide, no, I want to do webinar or I want to do uh, whatever other uh, uh, thing or I want to organize a conference. Or, so we, there we are, we, uh, each group organizes its own agenda in any case, submit, submit it to the committee, this is the, the tradition, so that we ensure coordination as committee, also with the uh, members that, uh, who are not present today, that means Nicolas Bengtin, Alison Furs, and Claire Howell. Uh, the six of us try to ensure that uh, the group, that there is no overlap between the groups, that uh, uh, we are not going beyond our mandate uh, in this sense, and from there, it's the, the whole idea of the IPTN is a world of freedom f for the good, basically. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's not creating, uh, uh, let's say, pallets and structures that block us. So that was the first yes. question. Yes. question. Um, <laughs> the second one is, actually, my work with the IPR SMEs is to write what you were describing, which is pretty basics copyright in Venezuela, what you need to do, for how many years you need to protect it. Um, so I, I wonder whether it should be more specific because I write it for the small and medium enterprises. So what we are requiring in here is for students, which I think are pretty much the same, don't they? Yeah. That, that's my question. So I, I, it will be pretty much the same leaflet that yeah. you were mentioning. Okay, so, I just needed that clarification. so there, an issue that could be considered, if the committee wants so, could be an issue of co-labeling some activities. We should, we should discuss that. Or acknowledging support for some activities as well. So it depends whether the activity is done, if it's done only by IPTN or, in pa or if other, if academics want to pull the energies, because the, the job proposed by Yolanda is gigantic. It's 200, uh, 200 uh, let's say, countries per uh, 10 branches of industrial and intellectual property law. So it makes 2,000. Uh, yeah, but it would be a, I mean, amazing work. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we would, we would do it, we could we'd let the comparative law group consider it. But well, Yes. Yeah. yes, but it takes a lot of time to, to, to still to write all of them and above all to update all of them because when we have written them, uh, okay, there should be someone who follows the legislation. Venezuela is fine, it's a big country, but if we need to follow the legislation of Suriname, not talking, Maurizio, you would forgive me, of uh, smaller states <laughs> in Europe, so uh, uh, it's it's quite uh, uh, it's, it's it's really the project of Yolanda. I, I like it very much, but it's a big one. It's a well, I would not think it's so grand. I have to say, I was thinking on countries participating uh, intensively in the. Um, we have around fifty countries at the moment. That, that would be very interesting that we, you continue the discussion with the comparative law group to see, and with Yolanda, to see how this could be constructed to the best. I no. <laughs> Third question, Patricia. Yeah. You have to think now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It wasn't a question, it said, I said already that I, I would like to participate in the book chapter seven. 
and even Don saying, yes, we are going to contact each other to see the formalities and everything no. to see if I could commit. So thank you. It's going well. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Any other comments? Something happened on the... From? Okay. Yeah. So yes, please, um, Miglena, please. Yes, hello. Miglena. Yes. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, following Ulrika's, uh, let's say, um, motto to express our uh, desire to be included in the groups, I uh, wanted to ask you if it would be um, appropriate to ask to be included in the teaching IP for business and entrepreneurship. Um, you said that you don't have any feedback from this group, so I'm not really sure what is happening there, but um, I would really like to contribute to, to this topic. Okay, Miglena, I shall notify in the uh, report of the IPTN of your desire to join the working group and in the said report it will be notified as well that you uh, you, you express the, uh, the, the uh, uh, we will ask them what, what, what they are doing basically so we will uh, okay. make Thank a positive much. move which is including you in the said group and that I can do it on my own f because the groups are not cannot include and exclude. This is the committee. Mm -hmm. So the committee would, of course, include you. And then I'll ask the committee what they are doing, basically. Yes, and, and, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miglena. And I would like to say also that I would like to join to this business group uh, in order to see that uh, the, the group is not working so much until now, yes. Uh, and I was not in this group because I didn't have enough time, but I think we can join efforts mm, to make this work uh, working. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> please consider also my, <laughs> my okay. own proposal. I have written it in okay. the list, so when I'll, I'll add the names in the group and then we will work with Adoration also on how to remobilize the SAID group. Okay. And, and we can be uh, particularly in touch. That, that is the idea of the groups, as the networking was growing so big. So uh, the groups we create as an opportunity that people who have uh, more focused interest in one topic, yes, we can be more in touch and propose uh, things mm, uh, to approve to the committee, of course. Yes. Thank you. You are, you are also in the uh, art fashion. I, I, am, I don't know where I am. Yeah, <laughs> because she. Be, be, yeah, because she wanted to contribute to the fashion law books, so she will be in my group also. Yes, I, I wrote it. I wrote it. I, I to me it was. Uh, uh, I understood it this way, as if she contributes to the book. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you, Miglena. Maurizio? Uh, I expressed an interest as well to contribute to the group um, on a section maybe on fashion and GIs, so on agriculture strategy, if this, this makes sense, or if not to support you on the chapter of designs. And I think it's brilliant. It, it, this is means being part of the group, so I'm part of the group as well. Okay, great. Know, exactly Thank you. Good. Part. Thank you. Welcome on board, oh, also. <laughs> okay. Am Very I good. A pack today, so. Yeah. Uh, I actually, just sign now. <laughs> Actually, the fact that the, the, the group uh, on fashion is very big is, is very good yeah. because uh, there is the issue of the book. Yeah. So, uh, and the issue of the book, rather than the booklet, is a complex one for which as many contributors we have, as many high quality contributors we have, as good as it is. So, it's not a problem that a group be bigger than other ones. Any additional? Comments from our audience? So now, on the way forward, 
for EIPTN. We have focused since our last uh, presence meeting in Poitiers and our last meeting in, uh, uh, in Madrid online, thanks to Carlos Tercero University, we have focused on making the working group dynamic, avoiding that the IPTN be only an annual conference, but that there be, this be also a way that we meet over the year, thanks to the working group, thanks to their activities, and we be a larger family. Uh, on this, we have made achievements, and I'm very happy of this. We as committee have reviewed the situation and we're happy of these developments. Uh, the, now the next issue will be to decide where we will hold our next annual conference. We have received for the time being some informal proposals so we do not yet, uh, we cannot yet develop them. If there are volunteers, volunteer institutions to uh, host the next session, we always raise this question at the committee and uh, we would, of course, consider it for the next session or the following ones. So if the colleagues who are present in the room or listening at us are uh, uh, interested, please express now or later on your uh, interest. We already have received some interests of some colleagues who could not be present, and we will put it together, and as a committee, we'll forward it to you. So any proposal. The idea is that we cover a maximum of countries in Europe, a maximum of uh, universities. Uh, clearly enough, for the time being, Spain is the country that had, after the UK, the most frequently, the most frequent uh, sessions, because Spain had three, Alcala, under the leadership of Professor uh, uh, Perez Troya, uh, Carlos Tercero one online, and Carlos Tercero <laughs> two uh, online and in presence. So Spain has been the most, uh, the country mostly uh, most represented in the past uh, and in the present. <laughs> okay. So uh, the idea is to try to uh, be present in many uh, in many countries because making the uh, work the conference in a country attracts clearly enough uh, the scholars of the said country in larger numbers. And if not attracting at the conference itself, it has a secondary impact because after the conference they are joining for a reason or another, they have heard about or something like that. So this is why we, are in, we try to move in the various European countries. We have always done it. So I think there is, uh, uh, as often on this topic, a moment of reflection and we are just uh, ready to receive also by email your proposals on this. Okay. okay. So, so now, uh, uh, this is a very special moment in the conference because this is the moment to, uh, to reflect on our conference and uh, reflect on the current one. And we must admit that the current one met success thanks to uh, the fantastic support given by Carlos Tercero University. Uh, this fantastic support was organized under the leadership of Professor Fernando Bondia Roman, to whom we pay tribute. <laughs> and of the major support of the students whom we found for uh, the students of Carlos Tercero, who played a key role in supporting the conference and a key role 
for all students of intellectual property by permitting that there is now a getaway for them within EIPTN. So a double achievement. <laughs> now, the, uh, uh, this is also the moment to pay tribute to uh, the person who has been central and essential in making the, uh, uh, the event cheerful, successful, well-organized, well-structured, and well-sought, mm -hmm. Professor Yolanda Bechel, who is here <laughs> with us. This is why not only uh, the committee has decided to offer membership to Professor Bechel, after consulting, of course, Professor Fernando Bondia. Professor Bechel uh, has kindly accepted to join our committee. And in order to celebrate it, we decided to. sitting on this side. <laughs> and to close, no? yes. yes, we are going to close okay. um, with here. you as member of the committee, which is now, which now comprises seven colleagues. So, Yolanda Bechel, our new member, Adoracion Perestroya, Ulrika Venersten, Nicola Bankin was with us yesterday, Alison First, and she was online. Of course, uh, with online. She's not online now, I think. <laughs> but, and, of course, Claire Rowell as well. So, the, the committee is now thanking all of you for having been with us throughout these two intensive days where we avoided that you could get any suntan from Madrid. <laughs> we, uh, with Professor Bondia, we thought that we would really lock you in a splendid room, but a room with no windows, so that we are sure you were working. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, organized the lunches and the coffee breaks in the building, so that we are sure you were not this spread. <laughs> okay. And this is why we are so happy uh, that uh, even on a, a Saturday evening, we are so numerous, physically present here. So, all our warm, warm thanks to all of you. Uh, we will stay in touch by all means, and very actively. Uh, we also thank the colleagues who have braved complex uh, health rules to come, to, uh, to come here. Also, uh, for those who have taken uh, let's say, the risk of finding new health rules before going back home, so, <laughs> which is always an issue So nowadays. So we are really, really super, super happy that you could be uh, for all of us, uh, all of you here. That means all of us here. Thank you so much. We, uh, w once I shall have declared the uh, committee uh, uh, session of this year closed, I shall still ask you to stay in the room for two or three organizational matters that uh, we have to sort out for this evening and for tomorrow. Okay. 
Lovely. We are making you working tomorrow as well. I had some words as well, but... Um, they're Yolanda, the they floor were is going, yours. They were going to be too long. We have entertained you long enough. So just thank you very much, um, EIPTN, for choosing uh, Universidad Carlos III to organize and host the annual conference. And I cannot thank you enough, Professor Armand de Dieu, the board members, for um, choosing us. We are really, we have been happy to organize this and to to receive all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yolanda. This is the success of Carlos Tercero <laughs> and of the Master of Intellectual Property yes. uh, yeah. under the leadership of Professor Bondia. So we are really, really grateful to, to all of you. And now for tonight, no? Yes. We, we leave you for like an hour and a half, and we're going to have an uh, dinner European time. So we have a, a book to the table for 7.30. I think you will all have the address of the place. It's really close to where we had dinner yesterday. It's almost next door, so it's 10 minutes walk from the hotel. But you can go to the hotel for, for a little time, leave your things, rest. And I think it's better if today we meet directly there. Yes, at 7.30 directly there. For those who for some reason have lost the address, which happens sometimes to me when I go to a <laughs> conference, don't hesitate to ask, yes, sure. to ask us again. So, uh, all, uh, we'll so, so, so we'll see each other there. <laughs> so, which is very good for tomorrow. I need your attention for tomorrow. Of course, not for the students, because we don't want to bother you on Sunday. <laughs> on, uh, tomorrow at 11.15, 11.30, we will do a one hour and a half walking tour uh, that uh, will be uh, uh, actually guided by me under the instructions received from Yolanda. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, I have to study all night uh, <laughs> the history of uh, each of the buildings of Madrid we will go through. So, uh, I need to know uh, from the participants who will be present tomorrow at this walking tour. So, uh, I 